Uh, we will tag you. <laughs> thank you. You know I'm screen recording that. Fuck an audio. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, I don't have any money. My wife's already got it all, so good luck extorting me. Nitsan, you're muted, just so know we can You're muted. You. And I have a good feeling that we want you to be muted. <laughs> Alex, you, re you reminded me of the time when my wife's credit card got stolen, but I never bother, bothered reporting it to the police because the robbers were spending less than she did. <laughs> <laughs> that, That's that a good one. Amazing. And we're, uh, we're live. Okay. Hi, Giovanni. Oh, yeah. Audio is good. We can start. <laughs> it sounds looking very good there. Get a room, you two. Go ahead, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Alex, we are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is where you're watching us right now. Welcome to the fourth day of the Open Sip Summit Distributed 2021. For all of you that have been with us, you've been enjoying some amazing topics and speakers, some in-depth discussions on really interesting SIP topics. I wanted to uh, welcome you all that are new to us today. Um, we're going to have four speakers. And uh, I wanted to mention that um, we're also this year uh, sponsored by a company called Subspace. William King actually had a discussion yesterday regarding what they do. So if you want to kind of rewind and get on yesterday's uh, YouTube talks and take a look at what they're doing, I think you'll find it very interesting. So today we're going to start off the day with uh, Vlad Payu. He's uh, from the Open Sips project, and he's going to be talking to us about generic load balance, uh, load based dispatching. Vlad is actually coming to us from our usual venue, if you will, in Amsterdam. Um, he thought that it was best you know, that he get there in order to deliver this, uh, this talk to us. Vlad, are you there? How are you doing? Yeah, it's all good. All good. I, I'm ready to start whenever the MC does, is done emceeing. Wow. <laughs> Such a pressure. Such a pressure, Alex. Well, seeing that when the MC is actually finished is up to his discretion, we could be here a little while. <laughs> yeah, carry on. But... I know how eager you are to get gone with your presentation, so I won't take any more of your time. Everybody, Vlad Payu. Woo! Thank you, Alex. So all good with the presentation? We yep, can see it. Good. Okay. Good. So as the MC said, my name is Vlad Payu. Nice to see you all again, hopefully next year in person here in Amsterdam. And uh, I'll be talking about generic load-based dispatching uh, with open SIPs. Uh, first, we'll be going to, let's say, the classic, the uh, usual load balancing um, options that uh, open SIPs has and uh, has for quite some while now. So it, it should be familiar to many of you. I'm talking about the load balancer and the dispatcher modules. Then we'll be going to what's new in 3.2 in terms of um, load balancing uh, options with open SIPs. And we'll cover some um, actual use cases about how to use the new features to perform some uh, nice load balancing. Uh, so as I said, the, let's say the classic options are the load balancer module and the dispatcher module. They're, um, Tools used to accomplish pretty much the same thing, load balancing, only that they differ in certain aspects. They each have their own, own pros and cons. And we'll just go through each of them shortly. The load balancer module relies on the dialog module to keep, um, let's say, a running count of all calls on all servers that you want to load balance. And uh, each call is assigned a list of resources that it's going to use. Um, when that particular call gets terminated, the resources automatically get freed up just because the module relies on the dialog module. When let's say provisioning certain uh, load balancing servers, over here I have two load balancing servers in group ID one. And for each of those servers, I've uh, configured that, let's say the first server, the that 100 
uh, can handle 32 PSTN calls and 10 overall conferencing servers. And um, in this example, the second server, let's say, is twice as big as the first one. It can handle 64 uh, concurrent calls towards PSTN and 20 conferencing uh, calls. And how you use the load balancer module, it's as easy as uh, calling the LB underscore start uh, script function exposed by the load balancer module. As parameter, the function takes the group ID, which uh, we have here in the database. And the, the second parameter, you have uh, the list of um, functionalities or uh, resources that the current call will use. In my example, I've uh, pasted, I've uh, sent PSTN and conference, so the load balance module will go ahead and find us the least busy server, which has both of them, both of the capacities uh, still available. Um, as disadvantages as, as, uh, by when using the load balancer module, uh, one of them is that it uh, assumes all calls are created equal. Uh, for the load balancer module, uh, it only looks at it from the SIP point of view. So various options like packetization time, codecs can impact the overall amount of CPU and um, let's say memory that one single call is using. Secondly, the module pretty, li uh, pretty much relies on manual fine tuning of the servers that you want to load balance. Because in my example, this server, the second one I've configured to be, let's say, twice as big as the first server. Even though in real life, when load balancing, like, let's say, a non-homogeneous uh, set of servers, it might not be so easy to decide that yeah, this server is twice as big because some servers might have four cores, other servers might have six cores. So it would be hard to, let's say, put an actual number on how big is a server compared to another. Um, also, one another disadvantage, let's say, is that it disregards real-time load information on the boxes. And what I mean by this is that even though in the database, let's say, for the first server, we configure that it can support 32 PSTN calls and 10 conferences, uh, let's say if a road script on that server decides to use all the CPU, then most likely that server won't be able to handle uh, the calls that we have described for it in the database. So it doesn't operate with any outside information. It just reads what it has in the database and automatically assumes those resources are available. Probably one of the least disadvantages is that it relies on the dialog module. Um, let's say it has a stateful approach uh, just because it has to keep state of uh, um, the resources being used by the dialog, uh, sorry, in the dialog module. So it's a little bit more resource intensive than the dispatcher module approach, which is a stateless uh, type of uh, load balancing. Let's just dive through also to dispatcher. Um, as opposed to the dialog module, it doesn't keep any sort of, uh, sorry, to the load balancer module, it doesn't keep any sort of state. Uh, it simply relies on hashing to spread the calls across multiple servers. And it's up to the, let's say, the script writer to, the OpenSIP script writer to decide how it wants to do the hashing. Uh, classic options are to hash over call ID, let's say, to ensure a pretty much even spread because call ID should be fairly random. You can hash over from or, or to URI, for example, to keep um, some calls on some particular servers. You can also do round, random. Random is usually <laughs> a good enough uh, option if you don't care much about anything. You just want to push the calls out and that's it. Rom Robin is another, let's say, option very often used by the dispatcher module. What it, guarantee, it does, it guarantees that the servers will get picked one by one. So again, it's a neat option for load balancing. And last but not least, you can hash over, let's say, your desired AVP uh, that you have populated in your script. For example, if you have in your script an AVP that uh, describes the customer ID that originated the current call, you can just hash over that AVP value and get 
a server to send uh, the call. And in such a way, you're ensuring that you're keeping all, um, let's say, the current client's calls on a single server, which may or may not be useful for you. Uh, how it works in terms of DB provisioning. Again, we have the dispatcher table. We define a group of three servers in this example. These IP of dot 100, 101, and 102. And um, similar to the, let's say, load balancer approach, in the dispatcher module, we have this weight column, uh, which you can use to define, uh, to say that some ser certain servers are of higher capacity than the other two. And this is, in this example, the last server here is twice as big as the other two servers. And in using it, uh, it's again a, a matter of just calling um, the DS and the source of the destination uh, function exposed by the dispatcher server, the dispatcher module. Uh, the first parameter is uh, here is the set ID, which we have from the database. And the second parameter is uh, the algorithm of hashing that the dispatcher module will do. In this case, uh, zero means hash over call ID, but if you're interested in finding all the um, the currently available algorithms, whether hash by uh, from to whatever you want to hash on, you can find it all in the documentation down below. Uh, as disadvantages by of using this approach, uh, again, depending on what you're hashing on, you might get an equal load spread across the servers, exactly as in the example that I gave you, the hashing by client ID. If you have, uh, let's say, a bigger client, uh, you might uh, overload a uh, specific server just because all his calls are going to hash to the same, uh, let's say, destination server uh, in your pool. Uh, and the other three disadvantages are pretty much the same as the load balancer module. It, assume, it assumes all calls are created equal, though certain may use more resources in terms of uh, CPU and memory. It relies on manual fine tuning because we have to manually provision this weight uh, column over here. And it doesn't really know about the real time load information on the box and whether it can actually send, uh, oh, sorry, can actually receive more calls or not. After that, uh, in OpenSIPS 2.4, I think the dispatcher module got a pretty nice upgrade. Uh, which is that you can now communicate with free switch via the event socket layer in order to fetch some real time information and compute a dynamic weight based on, uh, let's say, this info. So, starting from 2.4 onwards, OpenSIPS can get from free switch the, how much idle CPU there is, how many sessions there are, and what's the max configured session for this box. And uh, with this neat formula embedded in the dispatcher module, uh, you can, uh, let's say, uh, send calls to a free switch pool based on some uh, load information, some real time load information. Uh, this fixes some problems, but still there are disadvantages in the sense that this is a free switch only uh, solution because it relies on the ESL. And it's not really customizable in the sense that you might want to add more, um, let's say, metrics over here, do some, um, uh, do the load balancing based on other stuff, maybe like round trip time, which, or other options that you might think of. And uh, in this case, the formula for the weight calculation is hard coded. So this was what was previously available. And um, let's look at what 3.2 brings new in terms of load balancing. Uh, let's say it, build, it brings uh, new, let's say, building blocks available for you to, um, to do your load balancing logic uh, in whatever way that you wish. And the first addition, it, it's uh, is that OpenSIP 3.2 added real-time attributes that you can add to a dispatcher entry, to a server. Um, these attributes you essentially link from the script or from the MI level to a uh, um, server that you're dispatching to. And uh, let's say this information that you're attaching is 
fully opaque to open source, so open source on its own doesn't really uh, need that information or interpret it in any way. So it's up to the um, scriptwriter to uh, to make sense of this information. And uh, what I mean by this when I say you can attach information to a server to a, let's say a server that you're load balancing. In this example, I'm just calling via my the DS push script attributes, which is the MI function used for populating this. Um, and what I'm saying here is that for this server located at 127.0.0.1 at port 5061 and set ID one in the default partition, I just want to attach uh, this uh, this information. In this example, I'm just using a JSON, uh, let's say it's attributes. Just because OpenSIPS anyway doesn't read this in any shape or form, it just stores it for me, and uh, it's easier to uh, it's an easy way to access and uh, manipulate information. Next example, I'm just saying that okay, this server has a ping of uh, thirty thousand microseconds and uh, it has a load percentage of fifty uh, percent. Obviously, it's up to you with what you populate here and in whatever format. You can go ahead and use XML if it, you like it better. You can use JSON, you can use plain text, whatever. And then uh, further on, if you want to actually check that OpenSIPS has actually stored this information, you can just uh, call the ds underscore list mi function. And uh, you can see that OpenSIPS has saved this information. If you look here, it's um, you can notice that uh, OpenSIPS escaped some of the stuff, but that's just for printing uh, the mi output. OpenSIP saves it as exactly as uh, you've pushed it to the DS push script attributes uh, MI function. So that's one piece of the building blocks, the ability to uh, attach and update in real time some uh, information related strictly to one uh, server that you're uh, load balancing to. And the second addition is the new dispatcher algorithm uh, which currently, uh, but the uh, dispatcher algorithms are just auto incremented this time when new option is added. Uh, this latest algorithm is algorithm 10. And uh, what it does, it uh, essentially leaves it up to the script writer to manually calculate and decide what is the current load of the server they want to uh, send calls to. Uh, and uh, as, let's say, as input, you would receive in this open SIPs route, you would receive the destination you arrived, the actual IP import of the server that you want to check uh, what's the load on. Then you would receive the attributes which are coming from the database and the script attributes for the current server, which is uh, exactly what you populated from the open SIP script or from the MI level, this uh, JSON I just showed you. <coughs> And then OpenSIPS will just uh, rely on the return code from that OpenSIPS route, and uh, it will start sending calls to the to your uh, server pool in ascending wait order. So this essentially allows you to to decide what the list uh, occupied server and uh, just tell OpenSIPS to route to that. Next call, you calculate again with the next, uh, the least busy server, and so on. I'm just gonna show like a really basic example of how to use it, and then we'll dive into uh, some real life examples. In this, uh, let's say, dumb demo, uh, I'm just telling dispatcher that my algo route is called my dispatcher logic. So every time I would call ds underscore select destination for each server in my set ID, I would have this route called where it's up to me to decide uh, what's the current, let's say, uh, load balancing weight of the server. Uh, in this demo, I just populated the current score to one. I read the script attributes for this uh, dispatcher entry. I just parse it as JSON, and then if, I don't know, if certain value in that JSON exceeds uh, my threshold, I will just decide to penalize this uh, destination URI server and bump its score up by 10 points, and uh, just return the score for OpenSIPS to know that uh, the server, for whatever reason, uh, 
I would like to give it less calls just because I have bumped its core up and open sips is sorting in um, in ascending order. Um, so with this two building blocks, the ability to attach um, uh, some real time attributes to a server, to a load balancing server, and the ability to have an open sips route called that allows you to um, to decide what's the weight. We can do some really neat uh, load balancing scenarios. I'll just go to one quick uh, use case. I'll cover working, let's say, with open source servers and with closer source servers. First, let's go with working with open source servers. With an open server, further on, I mean something over which we have control over um, how it responds to open SIP, SIP messages. Please switch us with JNS. Pretty much everything open source is included here. And uh, as a final, uh, let's say, target, we want to do real-time load balancing on the on this pool of servers based on round trip time, total calls, and uh, the overall CPU load. So how we would go about this is uh, we would have OpenSIPs ping the servers and rely on, um, let's say, the option from the dispatcher module to send uh, pings once every while. How we configure the dispatcher module to send the pings, we just set DS probing one mode to one, which means ping all the servers. We will ping them with option messages once every second. So after we configure this in open SIPs, we would then have to um, to change our free switch asterisk or whatever other uh, open source server to uh, make it reply in its 200 OKs to, to open SIPs options with some uh, information. In this case, we said we targeted total number of calls and uh, CPU usage. So in this example, uh, my uh, destination server just returned that it has 10% uh, CPU usage and it, that it's currently handling 42 calls. So after we've changed our, let's say, uh, destination, uh, our free switch asterisk server uh, behavior when it comes to handling open SIPs replies, we can then start saving the information in open SIPs. Since we said we're interested in uh, also taking into account round trip time in the local routes, if we get an outbound uh, message, an options message being sent by OpenSIPS to the free switch or asterisk pool, we simply save the timestamp in seconds and microseconds um, at which the option message is about to go out. And we then simply set uh, an on reply route where we can uh, fetch the, the reply, the actual load information from free switch or asterisk. And then when this on reply route gets called, we simply uh, get the timestamp of the 200 OK received from free switch or asterisk. We do a time difference between uh, the time of the option, which uh, the time at which the option got sent out, and we subtract the time at which the reply came back. And that essentially gives us the round trip time uh, in this AVP microseconds ping. And then I would simply just start building a JSON. I uh, start with an empty JSON, and then uh, in the microseconds ping, I push this newly calculated uh, AVP, which gives us the round trip time. And then I just attach the CPU usage and the total number of calls from the headers that I just received from uh, my, uh, let's say, server in the load balancing pool. And then I simply call the SPush script attributes. I take my JSON that I've built and attach it to the source IP and source port of uh, um, the option reply, which in this case, it's the IP and port of the server that gave me this reply. So by doing this, uh, now in real time, OpenSIPS will have an updated uh, information about um, the load, the round trip time, and the total number of calls for all our servers. So in this example, I just did a quick DS list. Uh, probably I was testing with a local host box because I have a hilariously low uh, microseconds ping. 
but I get I can see that my CPU usage and total calls is uh, changing once every second because that's how we configured um, our options things to go out. So now that we have the uh, let's say the specific information attached to to all our servers that we want to load balance, it's just a matter of uh configuring um, the algo route and calling the select destination with the 10 algorithm which i said is uh, calling this open sips route and then in this in, uh, the my dispatcher logic uh we would pretty much have to decide on certain thresholds after which we want to penalize servers in this example i'm saying that if the server's uh, round trip time is over 30 milliseconds I'm just bunkering it score up and penalizing it by 10 points. If it's over 100 milliseconds, I'm giving it 100 points extra. And in a very similar way, I'm doing it for um, CPU usage, just setting certain thresholds like 40, 60, and 80% CPU usage, uh, <laughs> after which I'm also penalizing the uh, load balancing servers, just because I'm expecting probably if the load is over 80%, the first thing to start going wrong on that box. So I want to increase its score. And after uh, doing, let's say, the um, uh, downgrading the penalizing based on route trip time and CPU usage, I would just simply add the total number of calls to the overall server's score and return it to, um, to the dispatcher module. Uh, and then the dispatcher module would uh, just sort out my uh, entries ascendingly based on the score that I've returned. And um, I would get uh, a very neat load balancing done in the sense that oh, if all is going good with all the servers, I wouldn't be penalizing uh, them at all here because they would uh, have a good thing. And if the CPU usage is uh, below 40% on all my servers, the only metric that downgrades, let's say, my server performance is the total number of calls. So we're getting a fairly similar approach to what the load balancer and the dispatcher module were doing in a classical point of view. But in this case, if we get, uh, let's say, impacted at round trip time level or CPU usage level, we can furthermore decide to penalize servers and reduce the load on them by not sending them uh, any more calls. So with this approach, you can uh, fix uh, the disadvantages listed on the first couple of slides for the load balancer and dispatcher module <laughs> in the sense that it takes into account actual real-time load information from the servers that it's pretty much up to you to populate and decide which metrics of load are relevant in your case and then implement the logic uh, in your open sip script um, important to note here there's really no right or wrong load balancing logic it's up to you to experiment with various values uh, that you push to the um, real-time statistic uh, information per server and then uh, it's up to you to see how your traffic is shaping in real time based on uh, your open SIPs route logic. And the nice thing here is that you can always use the MI to test, let's say, disaster scenarios um, over which, uh, let's say, in this example, I'm pushing uh, a high uh, round trip time, a high CPU usage, and a big uh, number of calls across my servers, and I can see how I would be able to see how the traffic would shape up um, in a um, let's say disaster scenario where everything seems to be going wrong with that server. Um, so that was working with open servers and the approach that would seem let's say natural maybe to take to just take the um, the load information from their option replies and then uh, take that into account when actually routing for closed servers you can use pretty much the same exact load balancing logic as long as you are able to push the same uh, real-time statistics uh, to them via mi because with closed servers we're probably not going to be able to uh, to get it to reply with this nice uh, x headers to us 
So we're probably going to have to push their real-time statistics via MI. If we're lucky, they might support something like SNMP stats, or they might have some closed um, querying capabilities where you can get the CPU load and the total number of calls and some other, uh, let's say, metrics, and then push them to open steps via MI, just like this. And the nice thing is that you can use the exact same load balancing logic to balance open source, closed source servers. You can use the same logic to balance both free switch and asterisk servers at the same time. And they will all get, uh, let's say, uh, the same um, <clears throat> load evenly spread across them as long as you push the real time statistics, let's say, in a uniform format for all of them. So, I think I'm out pretty much out of time, but the takeaway message is that OpenSIPS 3.2 allows for a very flexible, generic, and true load based dispatching uh, towards any type of servers. It's a little bit more work because uh, there's uh, stuff that you need to do in the OpenSIPS route. You have to attach the information uh, on a per server basis but you would get a much better um, handling of, let's say, corner case scenarios where something goes very wrong on a server and uh, you keep sending calls to it and uh, you keep making uh, stuff worse and worse. While with a true load-based uh, dispatching um, option, you can um, detect that in real time and stop sending calls to it and uh, get an overall much better service that you're providing. So that's about breed. Breed now. <laughs> I can try. Any questions? We can have at least one question, and we are over the time, but we can allocate like. I have a question if uh, nobody else is. Jumps in. So uh, I was wondering uh, the route that you are trying to, uh, the route that you used to return the score, mm -hmm. is that somehow uh, uh, run in a locked fashion or is it, or uh, I mean, I guess it's for a specific destination, right? So yeah, it's every, uh, called every time once for each destination. So yeah. But it's There's not no under one. lock, so so you don't have like a, a snapshot of all the, or you can't take a snapshot of all the, of all the destinations. Yeah, I think there's uh, it's under the some sort of lock, definitely oh. internally. So every time, let's say, uh, the route is called, uh, it's on the. Mm -hmm. the lock, I think. I'm asking because uh, more or less the uh, we do have something similar. Of course, yours is it's more flexible. Uh, the dispatcher algorithm nine, where you can provision a variable and based on that variable, it can, you can set a score in the variable and it will mm -hmm. use. Uh, we thought it was more uh, more quicker back then when we made it, but actually it wasn't that quick, so we couldn't use it. Uh, and now that you, you are using a, a route, I imagine, although it is indeed more flexible, if you could have some uh, uh, some hooks to make, to run it under a lock, you will have like a more accurate um, accurate score or accurate score of all the destinations chosen for that uh, for that call. So yeah, that's. But you have to warn people not to make any curl queries or stuff like that. <laughs> 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 yeah, probably. It's done in the actual OpenSIPS worker context, so it's usually best to keep that route as light as possible anyway. And that was one of the reasons why the old statistics option wasn't really working, because there's a global lock on the statistics, so you couldn't get any real performance out of them. Yeah, but it it was indeed, but uh, the time we were evaluating each, uh, each stat was different, so you couldn't have like a... a Correct or an accurate state of all the of the 
all the destinations are false. That's why. Anyways, nice, uh, nice job. I, I love it. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, in this, uh, like in the use, practical use case I've shown, I'm updating the statistics once every second. So it's not true real time. It's every second close to real time. Oh, okay. Okay. It's good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's good enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I'll be on Slack in case everybody, anybody else has questions. Okay, I think I know your email address. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for yes. the presentation, Vlad. Bye bye. Thank you, Vlad. Okay. Um, yeah, so next, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, next uh, presentation is mine and uh, it's about about it's about uh, quite uh, i would say hot topic uh, in the last uh, years uh, it's around uh, the microsoft uh, ms teams and how to do it uh, how to do uh, it uh, to work with uh, uh, with uh, open sips um, starting with some uh, facts uh, Besides, uh, you know, as any, uh, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft product, so running under uh, Microsoft, Microsoft operating systems on the Windows, uh, it's automatically gaining a lot of traction. Also with this online in the last uh, almost two years, the MS teams actually gain a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, traction when it comes to being used, I know, on the end user uh, <clears throat> uh, side. And on the other side, um, Open SIPs as a component for providing, uh, you know, SIP infrastructure uh, uh, becomes it's it's really uh, handy and popular to use. So automatically becomes a, a very good option uh, for implementing the MS team termination or direct routing, how it's called in the uh, in the MS team. Uh, uh, terminology basically the ability of an ms teams uh, tenant of an, of an ms teams pbx instance uh, to send calls through sip outside to you know usually for termination uh, purposes uh, this is the typical uh, uh, layout uh, for uh, for using uh, open SIP as an sbc for uh, for the microsoft so uh, microsoft teams Again, Microsoft Teams is basically a cloud. It's a multi-tenant uh, cloud. So you have various PBXs, uh, as they call it, more tenants uh, in there. And uh, keep in mind that MS Teams works with uh, TLS and SRTP. So these are the most uh, important uh, things to mention, multi-tenant, TLS, SRTP. Uh, and uh, basically the purpose of the open SIPs is to make uh, to make uh, the MS team direct routing uh, termination to talk to typically you know care direct uh, directly to carriers for uh, uh, termination purposes so just to be able to dial into the PSTN world or maybe if you are a service provider you want to somehow uh, allow the uh, MS teams uh, users to uh, talk to other users that you you have directly into your SIP uh, service. So um, what are the challenges over here? Well, uh, first of all, um, as when it comes to everything, uh, Microsoft has its own understanding and flavor of, uh, of SIP. So it's not necessarily uh, doing the things uh, as we are used to. I'm not saying they are uh, they are breaking the RFC. I'm just saying that it's very unusual and pushing things to the limit when it comes to how the SIP should work. So from this perspective, uh, the interoperability it's quite uh, uh, tricky to achieve. Uh, secondly, uh, the fact that it's a multi-tenant uh, service, uh, the MS Teams, uh, it's again uh, it's again uh, difficult to. Uh, uh, to cope with, especially that this multi-tenant uh, uh, flavor goes a lot, impacts a lot the SIP and the TLS layer. So you have a lot of things to take into the consideration if you want to interconnect with MS Teams with multiple tenants in the same uh, time. And uh, uh, 
uh, at the end, uh, it's need, I need to uh, to to say it. Uh, what we are trying to achieve here while while using OpenSips is to make um, uh, this crossing from MS Teams to let's say the regular SIP as transparent as possible for the rest of the SIP infrastructure. So I want to be able to support uh, MS Teams uh, trunks, but uh, you know without uh, more or less changing anything into my system. Um, so I need the open SIPs to stay in the middle and take care of all the particularities of this uh, interconnection. A good starting point for this uh, discussion about uh, open SIPs as uh, and uh, MS Teams uh, as uh, MS Teams SBC uh, is uh, this uh, this uh, blog. As you see, it's a really I wouldn't go so far old, uh, but uh, it exists for some time. It's uh, like almost two years ago. Uh, and it covers uh, the basics, like uh, how you can configure this uh, direct uh, routing uh, into MS Teams in order to work with uh, with OpenSIPs. And on the other hand, how to work with uh, OpenSIPs, uh, how to configure, you know, the TLS part in OpenSIPs and so on. Uh, but the whole approach uh, is done having in mind that it's a single tenant interconnection. So what you what you have over there, it works only for one tenant it doesn't support multi-tenant in ms team side and uh, uh, secondly it's a kind of um, uh, transparent uh, sbc uh, meaning that uh, it's not uh, hiding uh, all the uh, particularities in terms of uh, how the uh, how ms teams works uh, for, uh, with the class 5 features um, the things that may impact your uh, you know, uh, a carrier or a gateway, or sorry, or a provider. We will see later about these particularities. But the idea is, in terms of signaling, it's just a simple path through. So uh, now let's see how we can, uh, like how can, uh, how we can uh, address uh, address this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, concerns. And uh, we have to look uh, look at them from uh, uh, from the perspective of multiple layers, uh, because okay, they have a really uh, heavy impact on all the verticals into into uh, into the OpenSIPS SBC, uh, starting from uh, TLS TCP layer, SIP layer, and then the media layer. So let's uh, let's uh, start with the TLS uh, layer. And uh, as, uh, as I said, the TLS actually goes into a bit in the, in, into two aspects. It's uh, actually, you know, a TLS at the end of the day, it's a TCP connection, which has on top uh, more or less encryption with, uh, with uh, using the TLS certificate. So let's look uh, uh, at this TLS layer from these uh, two perspectives, the TCP connection itself, and then the TLS uh, certificate. Uh, from the perspective of a TLS uh, connection, what is worthy to mention is that the interconnection with the MS Teams is actually asymmetric. So basically, uh, each party opens a TCP connection uh, to the other side, the connection that it will uh, reuse for the options, for the pinging, and when uh, doing uh, calls. Um, so uh, do not expect to see only one. If you see the two of them, that's uh, pretty OK. And into your configuration, you have to be uh, ready all the time to cope with uh, you know, this asymmetric bidirectional um, uh, communication. And, and we will see that uh, this uh, this uh, asymmetricity has a quite huge impact when it comes to the TLS side. Uh, on the TLS uh, side, um, let's start by mentioning that uh, in MS Teams, each uh, tenant basically is defined as a key, if I can so, so, say so, uh, by a uh, unique uh, SIP domain. And also by a TLS certificate that has to match the SIP domain. So just be a bit careful. I said a different unique SIP domain, but the TLS must match the SIP domain, but it doesn't have to be unique. We will see uh, later that. And um, these are the two uh, the two elements, the SIP domain and the TLS certificates, um, that are again uh, identifying the MS Teams tenant when you configure and we do this direct routing. Um, in terms of, uh, of the TLS uh, certificates, uh, depending on how you use them, you have uh, two, uh, two options. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the, uh, 
uh, the, the TLS certificates are basically, or how you want to use it, it's, it's uh, dictated by the, um, uh, more or less by the OpenSIPS SBC, so uh, um, how you want to, uh, to be used. Um, as said, the only requirement or restriction is for the, uh, for the um, um, certificate to match the SIP domain of the MS Teams tenants. So first option, the quite popular and simple one, is you get a wildcard certificate that covers all the tenants. So I have like a start.msteams.opensips.org and then all my SIP, uh, my, uh, SIP domains for the tenants are like tenant1.msteams.org and, and so on. Again, MS Team does, doesn't really care what is the so-called SIP domain. It has doesn't have to be resolvable or anything like this. It's more or less like a, uh, just a SIP domain uh, from uh, from their perspective, like a name. Uh, with a wildcard certificate, okay, that's uh, simple. Or you can use dedicated certificates, which means the the SIP domains they have no common uh, uh, common root. They are completely different. So in that case you will end up with different uh, unique uh, certificates for each uh, tenant. Going into the details, if we have the wildcard um, uh, certificate, of course, you need only one. And uh, what are the implications from the TLS and TCP uh, perspective? Uh, well, in, uh, in uh, um, um, OpenSIPS, uh, basically, an, uh, uh, a TCP connection and a, a TLS connection is reused uh, as time as uh, you have as destination uh, the same uh, IP port and the same certificate. So, if uh, all your tenants will have uh, will share basically the same wildcard certificate, and again, uh, MS Teams it's a, it's a, it's a hosted service, so basically all the tenants they do, do have the same IP addresses. Uh, then um, all the traffic going to MS Teams from OpenSIPS will share the same TCP TLS connection because it's the same de destination, generic MS Team Cloud, and it's the same uh, key. But keep in mind, connections uh, the TCP connection are asymmetric, so in the opposite direction, the MS Teams will open one connection for each tenant. So if going from OpenSIPS to uh, Microsoft, if you have multiple tenants uh, supported, all of them will go, uh, all the traffic uh, related to, to the, those uh, tenants will go through the same uh, connection because again, the destination and the certificate is the same. So the connection will be reused by OpenSIPS. But in the opposite direction, there will be uh, in the, uh, by MS Teams, uh, we have uh, different connections uh, open, one for each uh, tenant. Um, this might be a bit of a problem um, uh, if you really have a huge amount of traffic in terms of a lot of tenants, a lot of traffic, because you know this uh, single connection, which is uh, reused by Apple Teams, may become a potential, uh, you know, um, a bottleneck. But again, it's a potential, right? But it's a good something to take care of. Um, going for the second model for the dedicated uh, certificate. So basically, each uh, tenant has its own dedicated uh, unique certificate uh, in uh, on the SBC. Uh, what are the implications when, in this case, uh, for uh, each tenant, also going from OpenSIPS to MS Teams, we will have this time a dedicated TCP TLS connection. Why? Because the certificate is different. So even the destination is still the same to the cloud of MS Teams. Uh, the certificate is uh, it's, a, it's a different one. So uh, if you enable this uh, certificate check on connection reusage uh, parameter, and you should do this, uh, then it will result in a different uh, TCP uh, TLS uh, connection. Um, for the incoming uh, TLS connection, the uh, SNI support uh, will be used uh, because we need to detect the right uh, tenant and present the proper uh, certificate uh, 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 for that uh, tenant. So uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, the uh, SNI support was uh, uh, added in uh, 3.0 or 3.1 OpenSIPS. 
So you should use one of these uh, versions in order to uh, be able that OpenSIPs will use the right certificate when the connection comes uh, comes in from uh, MS Teams. Again, this is valid only if you use uh, uh, multi-tenants on the same OpenSIPs uh, instance. So uh, in in a case in, in a case of a um, uh, well, sorry, it's a dedicated certificate, a title, not a wildcard certificate. Uh, in this case, you know, going from the OpenSIPs to MS Teams, we have, um, you know, a dedicated uh, connection with different uh, TLS certificates. And of course, in the opposite direction, uh, we have uh, their pair. So in this case, it's more or less uh, two connections per uh, tenant. There is no uh, reusage at all. Um, what's uh, the, let's say, the challenge over here? It's the fact that um, you have more or less uh, a need to dynamically uh, um, manage certificates into OpenSIPs because uh, you will have to, uh, for each tenant, you need a certificate. So if you dynamically create uh, tenants into, into OpenSIPs, you need to provision also a separate uh, certificate into the TLS uh, management uh, module. Uh, basically, uh, you need to define a TLS client server domain uh, into the TLS management uh, module for each uh, tenant. So um, it's a bit of an extra work, uh, but it's very useful if you are smart enough and use the SQL DB support. So you provision the TLS certificates through the database. Of course, in that case, you can correlate a bit logically speaking, uh, with uh, with the definition of uh, of uh, of the tenants uh, into into OpenSIPs. So it's uh, it's uh, doable, but just you have to be careful of some things over here. So this uh, this was the SIP layer, uh, sorry, the TLS uh, layer. So uh, let's uh, move a bit higher to the SIP layer this time. Uh, first and probably a very simple, straightforward uh, aspect here, it's about the options ping. So uh, MS Teams uh, expects, uh, the, in this case, the OpenSIPS SBC to reply to, the, uh, to its options, but in the same time, it, uh, it, uh, it expects to receive options. So the option uh, pinging must go in uh, both directions. Um, otherwise, uh, the MS Teams will not uh, see the uh, direct uh, routing as active. So you need the cross option, uh, working options with the 200 replies and everything in order to have the direct uh, routing um, enabled in, um, activated, sorry, in <coughs> uh, MS Teams. Um, as uh, mentioned before, each uh, MS Teams uh, tenant uh, has its own uh, SIP domain. So it's one of the property defining the, MS, the, the tenant. Uh, so the MS Teams expects that uh, all the traffic uh, related uh, to that tenant will carry in the from and to and contact headers that SIP domain. So this is especially the contact part, that's it's one of the weirdness of, uh, of MS Teams because typically contact should be just an IP, it's for routing purposes, but the MS Teams requires you to populate the contact header with actually the SIP domain of that, of the tenant involved in, in, uh, in the call. So for each SIP call you have, depending on uh, uh, what's the, uh, MS, the involved MS Teams uh, tenant, uh, in the open SIPs SBC, you'll have to uh, fill in the right uh, SIP uh, domain. So you use the, to uh, dynamically advertise the right uh, SIP domain into the contact uh, into the contact uh, uh, header. Um, usually, that's uh, um, that's not a problem if you use like a single tenant because you just uh, you know do an. Uh, uh, you may use an uh, advertised uh, hard-coded on the socket uh, definition. Uh, but if you think of uh, the fact that, okay, you uh, in terms of uh, OpenSIPs, you have a single socket, TLS socket for the network side, uh, which uh, holds uh, multiple uh, TLS connection going to different uh, tenants, um, uh, definitely advertising on a socket, it's not an option because, again, the same um, network socket will hold a bunch of uh, connection which may advertise different 
uh, SIP domains into the uh, contact headers, depending on which uh, uh, tenant uh, the call is related uh, to. So uh, just an idea on, uh, of uh, how it work, how it looks like into an uh, uh, you know into a multi-tenant uh, uh, SBC. Uh, you see for each tenant, the contact uh, has the actual uh, SIP domain. And uh, for that, uh, the, if you want to support multi te multiple tenants, you have to, uh, instead of doing advertising at the socket level, you have to do advertising at the call level. And ideally, you should use a topology hiding and using the set advertise address uh, from the script level in order to, you know, uh, for a call, uh, for a whole call to advertise a specific uh, contact. Uh, with a contact, it's a bit, uh, let's say, more tricky because, uh, um, you know, typically the contact it's um, um, managed by OpenSIPs uh, um, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, uh, replacing and taking care of the values. Um, so it's not supposed to be manually changed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's the whole idea of using the topology hiding because you, uh, you need to actually replace and put the SIP uh, uh, domain of the tenant over there. So it's a bit of a must to do the topology hiding and to use the advertise address in order to force the SIP domain instead of typical IP address of uh, open SIPs. Um, that's uh, one of the things about advertising the right SIP domain when it comes to the SIP layer. The other one, it's about the SIP, let's, let's say SIP engine. What's the whole idea here? Um, again, that's a particularity of uh, how MS Teams uh, understands uh, SIP. And um, when it comes to different uh, class five uh, features like music on hold, um, MS Teams uh, does uh, an, uh, particular implementations, uh, which means, uh, for example, for music on hold, instead of uh, suppressing the restarting audio, it's actually doing kind of a it's actually doing a call transfer to a media server and then it recovers and it's transferring you back again, probably to the endpoint and so on. So it's uh, using a lot the idea of, uh, you know, uh, transferring or replacing calls. And uh, MS Teams for that, it's using uh, two SIP, um, let's say supports. Uh, one is the typical unattended call transfer, so the refer method, uh, or uh, it's also able to use the call uh, replacement. So you're with uh, um, creating a completely new call with replaces header in order to, you know, let's say uh, override an existing uh, call. Uh, this is fine if you, if you let's say, if um, uh, you have uh, the MS Teams, the SBC, and then let's say a PBX or something like that, because uh, a PBX may, uh, 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 properly handle a replaces or a refer, but uh, that's not acceptable if uh, you have a MS team with the OpenSIPS SBC and then a carrier. Because for security reasons, the carriers or gateways, they do not accept any kind of call transfer because again, it's, um, it's a security uh, gap from their perspective. They have no idea where you transfer the call to and they don't want to deal with that. So from their perspective, you should not do that. So, uh, Going back to one of the original uh, ideas that the SBC should provide an, uh, uh, let's say, transparent interfacing between MS Teams and, you know, the, the in this particular case, the carrier, we need to find a way to handle this kind of refer replaces at the um, uh, OpenSIPS SBC uh, uh, layer. So typical solution. Um, is to use the B2B user agent uh, support into, uh, into OpenSIPS. Um, and uh, the easiest way to, you know, to use this uh, B2B support is to actually force MS Teams to use all the time the refer mechanism, so the, the transfer, uh, to do the unattended call transfer. And you can do this uh, by, uh, uh, whenever you send a call or you accept a call uh, for MS Teams, you have to uh, disable the replaces support. So in the require header, you remove the replaces and to, uh, to be sure that the refer is advertised as an allowed uh, method. 
And if you do that, again, for the calls sent or accepted uh, through the MS Teams, uh, MS Teams will automatically use only a refer uh, for doing all the its uh, internal dirty work. And uh, the B2B OpenSIPS is able to internally handle, so transparently handle these uh, refers without uh, propagating on the other side, let's say carrier or um, a gateway side. So if you have like a typical call uh, established through the OpenSIPS uh, as a SBC, um, of course, there are like uh, different colors over here because uh, we said uh, OpenSIPS in this case, it's acting as a B2B. So from this, from the SIP perspective, there are different calls. Um, if the MS Teams will want to do like a music on hold, uh, it will generate a refer to C, where C it's, it might be an internal resource of the of the MS Team Cloud, uh, like a media server, and uh, this will be actually handled by uh, by uh, OpenSIP. So a new call will be generated towards the C uh, resource, uh, and it will be bridged with the original call uh, on the right side. So basically, uh, the whole thing will be more or less transparent for the gateway carrier. So uh, you can contain the particularities of uh, these MS teams. Um, I said you're almost transparent because uh, you have just to have to be uh, careful a bit. Um, the OpenSIPS back-to-back uh, is using uh, the, when doing re-invites in order to bridge new destination, it's using uh, late SDP negotiation. Uh, that's a pretty standard thing, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, maybe a one or two percent uh, in, of cases, uh, the end device may not, like gate in this case, may not properly support this. So you have to check. But again, it's a standard RFC, uh, so um, it's not uh, anything weird. But being uh, a feature not so uh, you know used daily uh, in uh, in SIP, you need to check uh, to be sure that it's supported. And uh, to uh, more or less to uh, wrap up everything, going a bit also through the media layer. Um, I know media is a bit outside OpenSIS, but still, because we said the MS Teams, it's about uh, TLS and RTP, SRTP, sorry. And if you want to be fully transparent, so you don't need to say, hey, do you, carrier, do you support uh, SRTP? So in that case, you should be the one doing the art SRTP to RTP conversion uh, by pinning uh, or proxying the media uh, uh, through your uh, OpenSIP. So, and you can uh, you can do this using the RTP engine in conjunction conjunction with uh, uh, with uh, OpenSIPs. And uh, because you know, you know, we all know that media scales uh, worse than SIP. So even though an OpenSIPs instance can do like uh, maybe. Uh, tens of thousands of calls. That's not valid uh, for an um, um, uh, for a, a generic relay. So in that case, of course, you'll need to use multiple uh, media media engine, and OpenSIPS can do that. Can control a farm of uh, um, RTP uh, engine uh, uh, instances in order to distribute the calls uh, through. And uh, Razvan did in the first day a very, very good presentation on that, how you can even do the failover or balancing of media between uh, between the instances and, and so on. So basically, overall, you have, uh, you have all the things that you need in order to achieve this MS Teams uh, integration with OpenSIPS. Um, uh, it's just, you know, it's tricky, but it's very, very doable. And I think I'm out of uh, time, more or less. We propagate this delay uh, through the presentation. Uh, you are out of time. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I, uh, I'll, try, I'll try to do something to, you know, to compensate. But you might be somehow giving Dan a couple of more minutes to finish his slides. Uh, yeah, just uh, then, just give us a sign when you are ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> we can do some chit chat in the meanwhile. Just do we have any questions? Maybe we can take one question. Any questions out there? I have a, an advertising that uh, in my presentation that will be after the done, uh, done presentation, so after the next one. Uh, I will rephrase uh, a lot of uh, aspects that Bogdan uh, just uh, showed 
in uh, uh, very uh, proper and technical ways. I will uh, touch them uh, in a four dummies uh, format that uh, if someone has had some difficulty uh, in, in following, uh, it will be much easier, uh, let's say, dump it down uh, in my presentation. <laughs> Can I can I make a question? Still, do you have, do you still have time? Or? No, we I'll... have two minutes. You quickly ask and vote them quickly. We can we can buy some time. <laughs> we can buy some time. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Bogdan, uh, is there a way to automate the the re renewal of the certificates from the files to the database? Uh, well, this is somehow outside the scope of uh, open tips, uh, but uh, the idea is while you are using the TLS uh, management uh, module uh, with the database support, uh, definitely you can have an uh, outside script that it's able, to, let's say, does the certificate renewal. It has to upload after the renewal into the database and uh, just to do, an, um, I think it's a TLS reload. So basically to instruct OpenSIPS to reload the certificate. So at the end, the result will be that the new certificates will be in the OpenSIPS uh, memory. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, that's typically not enough. It's just, uh, how to say, half of a problem uh, because uh, this will not affect the ongoing connections. Not sure if, okay, let's say that's something that you need. I mean, the, all of the existing connections will still use uh, the old initial yes. certificate. And um, if uh, this is a new certificate, probably you'll have some uh, connection in parallel open to the, to the destination. To be honest, I never tried uh, to do this in, uh, uh, you know, to do this, uh, to see exactly what it happens. I mean, to observe what it happens. It's more like a theoretical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, estimation of what should happen. But uh, the potential issues, I think, is again about uh, the ongoing connections. Uh, it's it's not from the OpenSIP side; it might be from the other side. The ongoing connections that were established with the expired certificate at this very moment, and um, there, there there is also uh, the possibility that if you have uh, uh, new traffic going to the same destination through the TLS connection now, because the TLS certificate was changed. Uh, then a new connection will be open, you know, just mm -hmm. because the certificate is yeah. different. But uh, uh, I was, but I was not concerned about this. But yes, it's it's a, it's a, it's an issue when you. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's an issue. It's just a thing that you have to consider. I mean, potentially, I don't see them as a problem, um, like having two connections. At time is, you know, usually the problem is when you have none. <laughs> If you have two, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, no, it's, it's in, an interesting point. I, I haven't thought about uh, having two, two different certificates at the same time and both valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's all you two get. Yeah, and I see here, uh, Max, uh, the question was from uh, Slack, uh, sorry, Slack, not Slack, from uh, uh, YouTube. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, there are, uh, it's from Alexei uh, Vasiliev. Actually, he's the author of the original, um, I mean, of the not original, it's the only uh, post on uh, MS Teams integration. Uh, and there are no more SBCs that can work with dedicated TLS certificates and multi tenant. And as Max said, I'm not sure if it's a statement or a question. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, whatever it is, um, uh, bottom line, we managed to do with. Open SIPs with uh, 3.2 uh, to do this kind of um, uh, uh, integration with uh, uh, with MS Teams uh, to do both multi-tenant and the dedicated TLS, so not not using wild uh, card certificates. And uh, well, it's not a statement; it works. So basically, it's uh, you know it's reality. So now there are at least. Yeah. So I think we. Yeah, we are ten minutes plus. Sorry, Dan. I'll I will I will uh, compensate in a way or the other with your no worries. <laughs> All right, let's give Bogdan a quick round of applause. Well done, Bogdan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. For any more questions, take it to the summit chat on Slack. 
Bogdan will be there and happy to answer any more questions for you. Uh, coming up now, we have uh, Dan Bogos from CG Rates. He's going to be talking to us about SIP quality centric routing using CG Rates and Open SIPs. Dan, are you with us? Yeah, I hope I'm with you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Yeah. Perfect. So, guys, thank you very much for having us and doing this uh, conference once again. I think I, I, I love it. I, I liked it also last year. I tend to, to start enjoying uh, more and more online events because it's so comfortable to jump from one place to another. Although I love to, to get a beer in person with you. <laughs> so it's somewhere in between. Um, yeah, uh, again, thank you. And also thank you for giving me the, the excuse of having less time because I never finish my content in time. So now I have a reason for it. <laughs> so it's it's all good. Uh, let me just share my uh, screen, if I get it right. OK, so um, for, for those of you uh, first time here or uh, not knowing about us. Uh, we are uh, in the business since more than 14 years uh, doing uh, architecture or architecting server-side solutions in, in VoIP. Um, we have done over the years platforms covering both wholesale and uh, retail uh, business categories, even mixture of those. Uh, and um, by now we really say we, we can understand what means um, real-time processing and live system outages. Um, regarding CG rates, um, we are, it is uh, what we call real-time enterprise billing suite. It's enterprise because it's, it's um, a framework. It's very configurable. Um, you can use it for one business or another. Um, it, it has a lot of uh, applicability. So um, I think first you need to define your needs and then try to implement them. Uh, it is pluggable into existing infrastructures. So uh, you can uh, have um, uh, um, implementation uh, on multiple platforms, including uh, some uh, server agnostic implementations, you need to just write your own plugins. Uh, it's able also to easily accommodate new components. So once you have the infrastructure running, it should be fairly easy to, to uh, add a new component to existing uh, billing solution. And it's non-intrusive. So we try to, to stay away. Um, you are the one um, taking the decision whether you use the information we provide or not. So it's completely running in parallel to what you have today. Um, it's, it's all open source software. Uh, it was born sometimes in 2010. Uh, first sources were published on GitHub in 2012. Um, we, we publish everything um, because uh, we, we um, don't believe in this uh, security through obscurity. We like our code to be reviewed and to be pointed out whether uh, we are doing things wrongly or not. Uh, we have um, uh, a bit of different concept on releases. We want to, to support all our branches because uh, we understand our customers who are very conservative to move and to do upgrades. Um, we, we have learned over the years uh, from customers with, with active support. They are running on, on software release sometimes in 2015, and they don't want to move away from there. So uh, it is, it is, um, uh, this is why we have taken the decision to maintain all our branches uh, continuously. Right now, uh, we have uh, three branches. One is the, the official stable. One is the master, which is very close to become stable. And one is a, a very fresh, a new approach, which we uh, declare as uh, non-backwards compatible. 
where we have we are redesigning the the whole uh, um, stuff which we which is now uh, let's say 10 years old in architecture <clears throat> um, we don't have add-ons in private repositories and we really have a consideration for community contributions um, uh, here you can uh, join our uh, google group and really uh, make our life miserable if you consider there. It's all public. We, we never have removed a single thread from there. I'm not even sure if it's possible. Um, it's, it's a per performance-oriented software. Uh, we have for that uh, our secret weapon, which is our uh, caching system. So we do as less possible queries outside of our system because each of these queries means delays of uh, milliseconds, which are vital for a, for a real-time uh, system or for uh, a, a real-time design system. For that, we have in, in our cache, we have transactions, we have uh, LRU, uh, this list record used, and TTL records, so they auto-expire in the memory. So uh, you can limit the... Uh, the amount of cache or you can limit, limit the, the time uh, your data will stay and you can always combine it through the, the um, least uh, important data. This one, uh, the, the one uh, less used will be always kicked out first out of cache. Uh, this helps with the uh, performance a lot. And we have all the, the processing, it's asynchronous. Um, we are using uh, Golang and everybody knows that uh, it's by default uh, a multi-threading uh, system and multi-micro-threading uh, system. Um, it's a test-driven uh, development uh, since beginning. So we have more than 10,000 tests nowadays. Uh, this is actually how we uh, train our new developers they start actually from, from one of the first days in the code via the testing. So through this, their experience grows and our test coverage uh, grows. Um, we, we have um, many, many packages where we are close to 90 something uh, uh, percent of coverage in the testing. So um, th this we grew uh, also over the last years, close to very uh, many packages, close to 100% testing. And there we have also three types of testing. So we have the, the classical unit test, then we have the integration with the database and APIs, and then we have call testing with various platforms with support, uh, which we integrate with. Um, just to show that we, we are constantly and we never change our um, activity. Although uh, here it doesn't reflect our full activity since about six, six months or so, we are heavily working on another branch. So this is not reflected here. So even during this, you will be, um, uh, you see that the, the development or master was still constant although we have put more efforts on another branch on 1.0, which is this new approach I was telling you about. So uh, it's very highly um, high activity uh, software. Um, we have a modular architecture, uh, cloud ready. Um, we we uh, address more and more uh, this new architecture on uh, Docker, on Kubernetes, on other uh, virtualization systems. We are still uh, old school, so we like to do things still on, on uh, bare metal, but you know the, the industry is forcing us to, to be a bit more open-minded. So we will be uh, yeah, obeying <laughs> and we are obeying nowadays. And it's, it's easy to enhance by rewriting specific components of CG rates. Uh, feature rich, uh, we are both online and offline charging system. Uh, this was our initial functionality and this uh, runs since years in production systems, uh, very appealing to MVNOs and even tier one operators for uh, online charging. Um, we support multi-tenancy from day one. We have uh, real-time configuration reloads, so you don't have to uh, restart your, your uh, daemon. 
then um, we have um, a rating engine with derived charging, this uh, possibility to calculate the same CDR multiple times, your supplier, your distributors, your customer, uh, in order to see your revenue and for their distributors to, to see there uh, and so on. Then uh, something which is, is uh, more and more requested in LCR, the, the A number rating, uh, we support that too. Um, account balances management with uh, bundles. So uh, this is also related to the OCS stuff. A session or event charging with balance reservation and refunds. Uh, this is including the, the derived charging. So you can have uh, tens or thousands of uh, simultaneous sessions out of the same main session, if it makes sense to you. Um, CDR logging. Uh, we support for interim records and rating queues. Uh, this is interesting because uh, you can very easily integrate with your existing billing system. So you send us, you push us the CDRs as a row and a few milliseconds you get the CDR from us into a rating queue or whatever system you prefer um, already rated. So then you can, all you have to do is injected in your existing billing system without interacting with us. So it's it's pretty uh, simple to um, do, I don't know, billing assurance or to test CG rates against your existing billing system. Um, fraud detection with automatic mitigation, LCR with uh, QoS and bundles, call statistics uh, with pattern monitoring, uh, various interfaces to get in, diameter, radius, DNS, this uh, enum routing, which is still uh, popular. Uh, SIP server lately for uh, SIP redirects. If you have a reason, I know you are all uh, SIP proxy experts, but there are still some, some uh, companies with reasons to get uh, SIP redirects because they cannot modify their existing uh, uh, soft switch in order to interact with us. So for this, uh, there is a the SIP redirect option built in. Uh, resource allocation controller. So you can monitor virtual resources like uh, number of CPSs, simultaneous calls per destinations, per time, per whatever uh, slots uh, you have. We have uh, APIs uh, covering everything. So we say even with C when CG rates breathe, it breathes through an API. Uh, we have support for GOB, which is a Golang serialization. Uh, this is a bit typical for uh, Go programs if you are accessing CG rates from a, a Go daemon. Uh, JSON RPC, uh, this is uh, the, the preferred way of accessing CG rates directly over TCP socket, so you don't have to do it over HTTP. Even pasting over Telnet a, a properly formatted string will give you access to CG rates APIs. And HTTP JSON support for easier integration um, for, with uh, tools like Postman or other uh, uh, tools for APIs emulation or libraries for coming out from web world. Uh, we have also built in high availability and dynamic partitioning support. So uh, you can uh, configure uh, as many engines you like and uh, this can scale elastic or dynamic or static, depending on how, how you like it. And uh, we are uh, eager to hear about more uh, functionality, which is missing, although it's starting to be less and less uh, information, which is not already in the code. Uh, a bit of uh, our architecture, because uh, it helps to understand the system you are configuring. All this uh, feature uh, review is not a sale call. It is just for you to understand what you can get in your open source software. So um, in order to understand, this is how we, we do the magic. So uh, we have on the, the left side here, the, the agents, which are the interface is outside. Um, this can be a diameter radius, HTTP agent, DNS agent, or SIP, as I told you. These are various protocols. We maintain various libraries of this ourselves. 
uh, then a few open source um, uh, projects out there. Uh, and you don't see here open SIPs because these uh, agents we maintain, there is also open SIP CGRATES module, which is uh, deeply integrated in open SIPs and maintained by open SIPs developers. I would like to thank again for, for this uh, great module. Um, event reader service is a, is a generic event reader service, which is able to get events into the system um, from various places via some generic processing templates, which is our equivalent of OpenSafe scripting language. Um, these readers can uh, read stuff like um, uh, CSV files, uh, fixed width value files, XML uh, CDRs, JSON CDRs, um, SQL, where, whether it's MySQL, Postgres, um, MS SQL. So uh, a lot, a lot of sources, uh, a lot of um, um, message buses like RabbitMQ, Amazon, SQS, uh, uh, Kafka. So and so on. It's it's a lot of, of uh, interfaces which we provide to read CDRs from. These CDRs will be then, uh, or these events, they they get over the same interface out. And this is also where OpenSIPS comes in um, to these uh, sessions where we uh, it's a it's a subsystem, it's a daemon, it's an API server which emulates sessions. And this session is the one talking forward to um, other API services, whether it talks internally within process for performance or uh, for some reason of uh, scalability or failover, it talks to these components over network. So uh, all, all these uh, links can be both in process or over uh, TCP. So you can scale as much as you need. Uh, we have, um, um, yeah, uh, this dispatcher, which can replace any of these uh, components. And uh, the dispatcher can uh, hold on a, on a link. We have done some, some uh, testing. So it can hold something like 50,000 requests per second. So this, I would say, would be the limit of one, one dispatcher. And then you load balance behind, and various components can take various number of requests per second, uh, depending on the load, depending on, on where you, uh, when you run it, uh, how much CPU and memory and stuff like that. Um, in terms of functionality, all the functionality is implemented here in the middle. Uh, the roles for uh, rating and accounting, CDR server, uh, attributes for um, uh, mediation, data mediation, chargers for this multiple charging for emulating requests within the, the network, uh, resources for, for counting virtual resources or authorizing them, um, routes for generating routing. So this is the component which uh, uh, is the center of my talk today. Uh, by the way, today, I, since I have a, another talk on Monday, I have taken the liberty of putting more theory here, a, a bit more heavy theory than I usually do. Uh, and I'll, I'll put all this theory into practice on my talk on Monday. So please don't uh, make sure that you, you don't miss that because today's talk, talk is uh, uh, connected to the one on Monday. Um, stats, which is the, the statistics uh, server uh, we implement and thresholds for monitoring all the, the events around the network. It's, you can call it our own NMS uh, implemented by, by us. Then you have a generic filter. This was the, the uh, redesign and this gives a lot of flexibility because all these modules, including the agents are using these filters for taking decisions. So all the decisions are taken in one place and then it's easy to, to deal and work with all these modules. Um, Scheduler S is our own cron. So we have uh, implemented our own cron for um, um, 
uh, firing up events, for example, um, topping up accounts at regular interval, uh, resetting stats or thresholds or uh, whatever uh, things we need to do. This, this will be the heartbeat inside our system. Uh, this is configurable uh, down to, I think, uh, milliseconds or something following uh, cron expressions, but with our implementation. Um, EES would be the, the equivalent of the event reader system. This is event exporter system. So all the events coming in and being processed and being kicked out, for example, by CDR server will then um, go out through EES. And then on EES side, we have, um, I'll, I'll show you in one of my um, uh, slides, we have then within uh, the possibility to reach your uh, systems over different interfaces. So um, this way, this these are very much uh, compatible and they implement almost the same interfaces in and out. So you can do like loopings and uh, do re-rates via your system and uh, these two systems which we provide. And then there is the API server, which is used uh, by all of this uh, to, to manage the data for all of these uh, subsystems. Then there is a, a generic loading system, which you can use to feed in data for all of these modules. The data will be stored into uh, the, the, uh, one of these two databases, depending on, on your use case, and will be cached within the, the caching subsystem. Um, since we saw each other last time, uh, we have added some functionality um, uh, in the code. As I told you, uh, the SIP agent is new. We have uh, transaction support there. Uh, of course, it's very, very basic uh, compared to, actually, you cannot even compare to open SIPs. Uh, it just does uh, uh, 302 redirects. Uh, I, I wrote here for now, but I don't see any app other applicability for us to do. So uh, it, it makes no sense for us to, to act uh, as, a, as a complete uh, proxy or, or back to back agent because they are very, very strong and good solutions like OpenSIPs on the market. We are very basic and we will stay like, like that. Um, applications which uh, can be used uh, via the SIP agent, uh, you can have multi layer. Uh, call authorization. So this prepaid control, uh, steer authenticate, uh, password or IP um, address authorization, uh, and some call parameters. So we can, uh, we, we get it in the uh, invite and we reply in the 302 redirect. Of course, you need to be able to support processing the, the headers in the 302 redirects. Then um, call routing, via supplier selection uh, and uh, call parameters per uh, call leg. So you can influence max call duration, uh, steer initiate, uh, CLI control, uh, destination formatting. Uh, this is also a case of number portability, emergency services. So uh, this, this uh, are some application, business applications which you can use within the SIP agent, but these applications are available or our agent. So this is the same case for uh, OpenSIPS uh, uh, CGRATES module. It will give you access to all of this because uh, it's, it's all coming in via uh, session subsystem in our, uh, on our side. Uh, in case of steer shaken, uh, it's, it's a, a pretty standard uh, feature set. We have origination and uh, originator, originator and destination check, configurable at the station level. Um, you can have these two methods, authenticate or initiate uh, support. Uh, it is interoperable with open SIPs. We have tested uh, quite a while ago. And then uh, the, the special part in our implementation is that you have also API-based support. So you can um, call via uh, APIs to check the, the steer, the steer uh, 
capability. And um, maybe you you can uh, use a parallel system where OpenSIPS deal deals with uh, with the steer, and you do checks from your website via API uh, in Sigurate. Uh, this event exporter service, as I told you before, it's uh, it's a it's a new uh, module which we have implemented this year. Uh, it's replacing the old CDR exporter. The CDR exporter was only used for CDRs. Now we have a generic event exporter, and um, um, it's it's mirroring the the uh, ERS, the event reader uh, subsystem functionality. Um, it's giving access to events within multi multiple components. It's programmable via processor templates. It has improved logic and uh, fixed some corner cases which CDRE could not cover. It's using uh, attributes for uh, data uh, mediation and on output. Uh, some some uh, information on attributes will be in the next slides. Uh, as export interfaces, we have something like a virtual uh, export file CSV file fixed with value. HTTP post, HTTP JSON map, uh, AMQP JSON map, AMQP version one. So it is the, the uh, AMQP uh, standard to RabbitMQ and AMQP, which is implemented by Amazon. So there are two different interfaces there. Uh, SQS, Kafka, S3 uh, of Amazon again, Elasticsearch. So you can send the CDRs, which are already rated from CG rates into Elasticsearch. Uh, a generic SQL, you define uh, where you want to put which fields in your own format of database. Then we have recently also added NATS because NATS is becoming a thing <laughs> uh, and uh, some, some customer need it. So we have added also NATS support and some basic logging. If you want to just simply do tests on syslog and display there the CDRs, you can add it via the exporter. Um, on some, because as I told you, we, we started a complete rewrite and on our uh, 1.0 roadmap, this will be the, the, let's say the best of, uh, of the best from us. <laughs> um, uh, what on our roadmap uh, on, on V1.0, it's uh, replacing RALS rating using uh, better technologies like decimals because in the old RALS we were using floats. This was not entirely very bad, uh, but uh, it was slowing us down because we needed to do uh, rounding on every single operation. This was uh, expensive in terms of processing and also we were uh, losing precision. Um, also, this filters is the only one which is not supported by RALS. So uh, by, by using the new rates, we will also be able to use the filters, which is generic and centralized filtering. Uh, accounts, this uh, is replacing completely the, the RALS accounting part. The same story using decimals and filters. And now we have two separate subsystem rates and accounts, which uh, gives us some benefits. Uh, actions is um, uh, also refactored using filters and cron expressions instead of timings. This again gives a lot of flexibility extra. Uh, we also plan adding a, a component for IMS with the, the PCRF to, to control their uh, various uh, bandwidth used and uh, react, which is a common case very much connected to the to the OCS in uh, mobile world in the uh, four or five G's world, um, and also we we pro, uh, plan on unifying the database support. So we will only support a single database. Uh, we will not longer store the CDRs. We we would we will only export them in real time towards your system because it proves that there are less and less people uh, going with our own database schema and more and more uh, integrating with their existing or defining their own schemas. Um, so this this will, uh, it keeps us busy. Uh, we started refactoring sometimes, I think, uh, 
end of last summer. And uh, we say uh, it, we are very much close, let's say 80%, 85% done already. So uh, rates, accounts, actions are already done. And um, we work now integrating them back into the engine. As soon as we are done with, with the, uh, this, we will then release the, the 011 and continue with the um, 1.0 um, as, as the new master. Um, some, some applicability, actually two, um, two places where CG rates is uh, popular. One would be uh, as online charging system, as I told you, uh, it's an enterprise system or it's a it's a framework you can call it how you like and then it has applicability in in multiple industries and uh, business plans um, one one of the the majors is as online charging system and this is due to uh, all these um, advantages with connect fees rates units and uh, i think uh, it's it's something which um, you you might already know um, I'm going a bit faster through my slides just to make sure that I have time for a few questions. Um, so uh, the, the rating is very co uh, highly configurable. Uh, balances, you have unlimited balances or bundles per account of different types. So whether they are voice, data, SMS, monetary or generic, generic will cover them all in one place, including if you want to call Bitcoins as your um, uh, generic units. Um, you can combine them in, in any number of ways. Uh, then we have concurrent session handling. So for one account, you can have multiple concurrent sessions. So it's not about this derived charging because this is emulated. The concurrent sessions comes from your uh, switch and it's handled inside your own switch. So if you have a big uh, customer who sends you multiple calls from the same account, this is uh, already supported. We have balance reservation in chunks of debit interval, balance refunds, debit slip, and so on. Centralized CDR server, whether you are doing online um, CDR server or offline via uh, these files uh, or emulated, so, uh, or, or combination. You can have real-time events from the switch itself, for example, uh, open sips feeding in uh, start and initiate and terminate of the sessions event, and then feed in also the CDRs from the CSV, just to make sure that you didn't miss anything through the events. So uh, this is also possible. Um, the second applicability and the one uh, it's subject of my talk today is the uh, CG rates as dynamic routing system. Um, it's using a, a dedicated subsystem, this routes, which I, I showed you about. Um, it has full API coverage. The routing you can do uh, via SIP as well as directly via APIs. Uh, it is integrated with, within the session's authorized event. So uh, with one, only one API call coming from open SIPs, you can have um, uh, a lot of functionality or various functionality uh, of, uh, I told you, password authentication, CLI checks up, and, um, max usage checks up for prepaid and routing uh, retrieval. And it's integrated within all agents. Uh, we have uh, LRN support via attributes. So um, it's, it's always a hot topic, LRN number portability, whether it's um, uh, in US where it's uh, double complicated or in other uh, countries where it's a bit simpler. Um, we have optimized the system to, to have a, a stable response time. So uh, even if we have large data set, we have a, a, an implementation in production today of, uh, I think we have more than 30 million records. And I don't know if they did not double because they wanted to add also fixed uh, numbers and uh, it's it's working stable with stable response time of uh, adding not more than uh, I don't know a few milliseconds extra for the uh, number mapping. Um, this number 
uh, mapping. It's also valid for uh, emergency services. Um, we have also bundle and cost-based support via RALS. Um, we can we can have uh, multiple uh, mediation processes for the same event, and again, it should be um, uh, stable in terms of uh, data set. Um, QoS um, quality uh, of service filters based on the stat subsystem. Uh, it's in memory, it's performance optimized. So again, we, we, uh, when we take the decisions, uh, we need to, uh, or we can take them very fast. Um, QoS monitoring via thresholds. So we can also react when the stats are dropping, uh, whether we do notifications or actions, blocking routes, uh, changing routing, uh, and and so on. Uh, we have also automatic uh, the possibility to do automatic escalation procedures and stuff like that via these thresholds. Um, I I have added all of this some basic information of all of these modules. So just to know how you can configure and achieve or unleash the full functionality. Uh, there are various subsystems. In in um, all together, they offer you a lot of functionality. Of course, with um, the the downside of the learning curve of so many modules, but they can be combined to to achieve uh, the the most modern uh, routing system out there. Um, we also have uh, load balancing. Uh, there you can balance the traffic based on supplier ratio. We also have added load balancing for all the other uh, routing types. So even low least cost can do load balancing if you add filters for those. Um, now, since we talked about uh, attributes being used within uh, LRN, I'll also uh, use the time to tell you a few ideas on, on it. Um, so uh, attributes is able to personalize uh, your requests uh, with stored attributes. Um, you can have generic filters for matching queries, add, replace event fields, uh, mandatory flag if you want to fail it, um, multiple fields replacement in one request. Uh, it's a it's a type of attribute value store, uh, very optimized, very fast. Uh, it it took the ideas from LDAP or Dimeter, um, and it has support for multiple attributes type, whether they are constant, uh, static, or dynamic, like a, a variable, or uh, we also say composed and other uh, type of attributes. Um, Context-based data aliasing, so you can apply attributes based on various uh, stages where we, in your processing. And um, you can also have free-form context for particular queries. For example, you can use attributes even for uh, authorizing your users via your own uh, web portal. Uh, some idea in order to, to visualize the, the attributes. I, I have taken an API because I told you all what Siege Rates does is API based. Um, this, this setting of the attribute profile, this is a, a context for LCR. And with some activation interval, this will only be seen if our requests are within this uh, activation interval, which is uh, between 2014 and 2022 all the, the previous and after, they will not see this attribute profile. Um, some, some example of attribute, this will change in the request, uh, the field destination, and since it's a constant, we'll be uh, overwriting it to um, some uh, um, um, value. I see that I have missed adding the filter here, but uh, the, the filter normally it should be here, or there is another layer of filtering here. Uh, but uh, just for you to see, if I'm sending an event with uh, a destination uh, plus 49151, um, I'm uh, matching this via attributes and I will um, change the destination to a tag in this way, achieving um, carrier-based rates and not anymore uh, prefix-based rates. Uh, 
So my destination will become the owner of the uh, phone number. And then the, the, I will do my pricing for the, the number owner and not for the phone number anymore. This is uh, how we have done in some cases, uh, number portability uh, pricing. Um, there are uh, other ways you can um, um, pour, uh, define the aliasing towards another number which you use to define price for. That's also possible. So that's also uh, used in number portability. In these particular cases, we have used tags because this is also uh, fast and easier understandable. The uh, attributes I told you is used for uh, number mediation. Um, the, the rating, it can be used for um, uh, uh, cost calculation. It's uh, this functionality I already uh, told you about. Um, accounting with multiple uh, balances and um, balances can also expire. Uh, this accounting can be used if you are having bundles within your routing. So an example of a bundle of routing is when your uh, vendor, your carrier gives you um, 1000 minutes, which are cheaper or free during the weekend. Another uh, example is volume discounts. So your, your uh, vendor gives you 1000 uh, minutes with uh, 10 uh, cent and uh, per minute and then uh, 2,000 minutes more with 5 cents per minute. So in order to, to have this uh, calculated, we will be using uh, bundles. So as soon as your, your bundle of 1,000 minutes is gone, you will be charged or you will be uh, both charged as well as routed with the new um, uh, numbers or the new uh, prices which you receive from your vendor. Um, an example of um, get rating plan cost to in order to understand its complex complexity behind, uh, you can attach a list of rating plans to a supplier. So in this case, we, we want to know uh, the rates for a supplier. This is just a partial API call, which happens in the background for a particular supplier. And it, it we have destination and setup and usage. Uh, usage we need for pattern-based uh, list cost uh, calculation. So you don't only calculate for one minute, but depending on your uh, pattern, based on, on your um, average call duration at particular uh, time, you can have also your list cost considering exact uh, traffic pattern which you have by that time of day. Uh, based on uh, on the uh, rating plans I have defined for my supplier, the system goes and search and the first one which has my destination will be also the winner and will give out the cost. Inside this, the cost, uh, you can see this is the cost for one hour, uh, the usage, and then how we have calculated the cost. Um, you, you have all sorts of compressed factors. Uh, here you see uh, 3,500. 40 increments charged with this cost and and uh, stuff like that here the first one would be normally the connect fee and so on so you are very um, verbose in uh, uh, showing that to your customers um, again this is your rating uh, with uh, how you charge every single interval uh, here for example from the second number zero, you will be charging 20 cents per minute in increments of minute from the second. So after the first minute, you drop down the rates to uh, 10 cent and with an increment of seconds. So you charge first minute as a whole with 20 cent and you charge after the first minute, 10 cent in increments of one second. So and then you can uh, go deeper and deeper how you like play with, with all these settings. Um, stats is the one which offers you um, quality-based routing. Uh, it will compute stat metrics for your events. Uh, it's performance oriented, as I told you, in memory. Uh, you can have multiple stats queues matching one uh, event. 
uh, it can also uh, do asynchronous data backup in Nobla storage. So you can have, since stats are in memory, you can have them available also after restart. Um, they are highly configurable. You have ASR, which is average success ratio, average call duration, average call cost, total call cost, distinct destination uh, count, uh, post dial delay, generic sum of fields, average, uh, again, generic average of fields and generic distinct of fields. So, um, and then you have uh, integrated uh, metric thresholds. So you can send the, the events to a threshold subsystem. Uh, this is an example of how the stats can look like. These are uh, string metrics, uh, but they are also uh, float metrics, depending on how you can visualize them. Uh, you can see this is, these are some standard uh, metrics. Uh, you can see average call cost of 61.5. Uh, average call duration of uh, 1 minute 30 seconds, ASR 66. And then you can also see how uh, uh, a generic uh, field looks like. So this is uh, account summary of a holiday balance uh, with a value of three. So uh, you, you can go very deeply uh, into uh, this stats. Thresholds will monitor and react on event values. Um, using filters, uh, they can mul uh, monitor multiple uh, values. Uh, you can have active uh, floating protection, false negative protection. And again, you can also asynchronously uh, back up the thresholds since these are also in memory. You can execute multiple actions and both synchronously and asynchronously on threshold match. Uh, this is uh, some some parameters you see which you can use for the threshold so this one is saying as filters i want my stats instance of uh, whatever id to to react when it's the when the asr is less than 20. then um, you can have all these protections actions which will be uh, used to notify uh, stuff or do some uh, stuff here you can see how an event of stats and all the, the thresholds match and uh, executed. Routing, uh, I, I, I made it too, but a very little time. It's replacing the old supplier module. It has multiple routing strategies, weight-based, least cost-based, highest cost-based, quality-based, uh, uh, resource-based. So you can also um, route based on how many simultaneous channels you have open. Um, uh, this is resource ascending or resource descending and load based like a, a generic load balancer. The, the particular thing of routing is that it, um, uh, it processes the CDRs out of um, the, 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 the statistics and the, the decisions for load based, not on based on call setups, but on call completion. So uh, it, it is all about CDR events. Uh, we have um, uh, all the things which I have explained you before as uh, functionality. Then we have some supplier parameters which, which you can transparently pass to the switch. So for each supplier, you can feed in some additional uh, information from the CG rate side. Um, and uh, you can also have multiple routing profiles match. I'll show you in the API example. Uh, as roadmap on our side is contact center routing, which is not built in um, uh, some AI because it's very uh, pretty popular and it's not very hard to be added. And um, we also plan some standard, inter defining some standard interface for interconnects. Um, get route request uh, more or less uh, this is how you send an event to cg rates and you mention also how many routing profiles you want to match in this case are two so for my event uh, you see also the time of the request for my event uh, by the way everywhere in all our api calls you have the tenant so we are multi-tenant by default uh, and then as reply you can see there are two uh, routing profile match each with its own sorting strategy. So this one is a QoS, so quality-based sorting. 
and it offers you two route, routes, route three and uh, route two. And it also tells you how it has reached the, the ordering. Then to the, to the uh, quality-based routing, you can also add least cost-based routing as a failover. So you can get very, very complex and complicated routing setups in this way by combining the, the sorting strategy. Uh, routing integration within OpenSIPS, I want to, to come you and, and see me at work on Monday because there I will uh, do all this uh, integration setup and show you both um, uh, real-time prepaid as well as uh, routing for uh, between CG rates and OpenSIPS, which by the way, they work as a great team. So I, I made it in such way that I finished in time, however, not enough time, I think, for many questions. <laughs> you have plenty of time for questions, don't you worry. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, to uh, make uh, Giovanni mad on me. <laughs> no, no, no. Slowly, slowly, we can push everybody like with ten, uh, five, ten minutes, so. Just okay, coming so... to the reason for the bad scheduling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Do we have some questions for Dan? Please, or you can also get me later on Slack or other channels. Livio, Giovanni, I know one of you has a question. <laughs> I have, uh, I have one. Uh, you mentioned something in uh, like on the roadmap, some uh, kind of a call center or call contact uh, contact center uh, routing. Uh, yeah. Briefly, what is exactly you know what's the flavor? So what's so special about this? It's uh... so in in our um, view is um, more uh, functionality regarding skill based routing uh, and uh, other parameters which right now are not in within our filters. So um, various uh, failover combined with skill based and uh, combined with other uh, parameters which are needed in in uh, contact centers. Of so course. it's uh, it's uh, just uh, let's say inbound. It's not about uh, doing anything in the dialer area. No, I don't think so. Or at least not now. I I I simply uh, just just some uh, view. As I told mm -hmm. you, it's just for uh, contacting the guys behind the screens and uh, doing a bit wisely this, but not really uh, as a dedicated or business for us or something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks. I I have a mini question too. Uh, yes, please. Uh, when uh, when you <clears throat> uh, displayed the, the new feature uh, about the uh, rerouting uh, with uh, 302, uh, is this intended uh, uh, to be like a self-contained package uh, where you do uh, routing uh, and uh, rating? Uh, Without uh, use of uh, other uh, of other software, so a complete package for uh, fundamentally for uh, routing bulk. Uh, yes, so it's a it's a simplified solution for businesses not really deep into open source, because they normally you know uh, people which are into open source they know what they are doing. But people into uh, uh, with maybe uh, smaller businesses already uh, running uh, a system as uh, uh, closed source, and they want to enhance that one because they they don't afford or they cannot afford uh, another open source specialist or something. They they simply like to to get a solution without investing too much. So it's like a, a simplified version. Of yeah, that that can be almost a black box. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the idea behind that one. Although, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's give Dan a big round of applause, everyone. Dan, thank you thank so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. So, just so everybody knows, you need to stick around. We have one more presentation. Mr. Giovanni Maruzelli, I can't even say it right now. Maruzelli is uh, is going to be talking to us 
Uh, Alex, 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 sorry to interrupt you. How do you say? Do you say pizza or pizza? Give me a pie. <laughs> so it's Marucelli. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> With the hard Z. Hard Z. It's like pizza, nice. not pizza. <laughs> uh, there, there's a proper way. You can use your hand. Pizza. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> uh, use your hands and it works. <laughs> Giovanni's a well-known uh, contributor to the uh, to the community and several other open source communities. He's coming to us from Open Telecom IT. That's his company. He's going to be talking to us about WebRTC SIP via Open SIPs and RTP engine. And I see him here. So Giovanni, are you ready? Uh, I'll, I'll try to understand how to share. Okay, a window. Okay. Excellent. Take it away, sir. Okay, I, I see it's working. Uh, so the title is a WebRTC uh, SIP via OpenSIPs and RTP engine. And uh, uh, this is about me, the books, etc. <clears throat> Uh, the audience uh, of this uh, presentation is uh, someone that knows about SIP and uh, uh, wants to add uh, WebRTC to the services that it provides. And uh, we will see uh, fundamentally what's, uh, what's, what are the problems in adding uh, uh, WebRTC uh, to an already uh, suite of uh, services and uh, uh, why uh, <clears throat> WebRTC uh, has differences from uh, uh, the plain old uh, SIP uh, uh, that we are used to use. And uh, how uh, we can work with uh, OpenSIPs and uh, RTP Engine to overcome those obstacles and uh, uh, to allow for a smooth operation. Uh, from uh, uh, the SIP uh, point of view, uh, WebRTC uh, doesn't change nothing. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in uh, RFC uh, 7118, uh, uh, is uh, described how uh, to map uh, SIP uh, uh, into uh, WebRTC, uh, into WebSockets. And uh, those are really uh, very little details uh, about uh, um, some header now and there. But uh, uh, let's say 99% uh, is pure SIP, uh, exactly the same. And uh, uh, we will use uh, SDP uh, for the description uh, of, uh, of the media. So it's just another transport. It's like uh, uh, we already have uh, UDP, TCP, TLS uh, since uh, almost forever. And now we just add uh, WSS. So uh, secure web socket, uh, web socket secure. And uh, so this is uh, a reference of uh, how it can be uh, delivered a suite of services. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the external connections uh, to uh, clients uh, and the trunks. Uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, how our uh, active passive uh, uh, proxies uh, and uh, uh, both for signaling and media. And then uh, we have the forms uh, uh, that gives uh, our uh, SIP services uh, to uh, customers. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, let's see at the differences. And uh, usually, uh, VoIP and uh, real-time communication is uh, UDP-based and uh, is not encrypted. Uh, WebRTC is exactly uh, the opposite. It's TCP-based, and this changes really a lot of things, and uh, uh, is encrypted, both the, the signaling and the media. And this also uh, pose a lot of uh, challenges, particularly in the operational field. <clears throat> Let's categorize the UDP 
UDP. Uh, UDP uh, is uh, uh, the workhorse of uh, real-time communication and uh, uh, it's a protocol to exchange uh, uh, packets uh, uh, through the internet uh, without uh, any kind of uh, uh, guarantees. Uh, I send the packets and I hope the packets uh, will go uh, to the point B. I have uh, no at all any kind of guarantee uh, that the packet will arrive at the point B. And uh, if I send three packets, they can arrive out of order, for example. And uh, um, so uh, we have uh, uh, no uh, instrumentation inside the protocol uh, for having uh, um, uh, uh, let's say a guarantee of delivery and uh, uh, of content. Uh, it's very fast UDP, and uh, this is uh, uh, why it's the preferred uh, uh, vehicle for uh, uh, all kind of uh, real time things. Uh, that's because uh, usually uh, when you do real time things. Uh, uh, the important thing is that uh, you send stuff and uh, the stuff arrives uh, uh, on the other part and uh, the packets that will not make it, they are just discarded. So, uh, for example, uh, during, uh, uh, during a stream audio, uh, when uh, there is uh, um, some packet loss in the middle, you do not uh, resend them because it will uh, insert a delay and artifacts into uh, the sound, but uh, it, it will just be rendered uh, by a moment of silence or uh, some scratch if uh, uh, it uh, um, goes into calculation like codex. And uh, um, so UDP is just uh, shoot and forget. Uh, I will send it uh, and uh, is uh, responsibility of my peer or of my application to check uh, that uh, the packets uh, has arrived uh, to the other uh, peer. And uh, uh, another problem uh, of uh, UDP is that uh, it uh, because uh, is, uh, it has uh, uh, no uh, guaranteed order uh, etc uh, is very much better than uh, uh, that all your message uh, is uh, um, contained by one uh, physical packet. Uh, that because it will be transferred in its own uh, entirety and uh, it will not be fragmented because uh, 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 recreation of pack of uh, big packets from fragments uh, uh, is very problematic and uh, uh, is not so uh, well working. Uh, so. Usually, uh, we try to use, and also in the RSC uh, is uh, expressed that, that uh, up uh, until the dimension of the packet, uh, you better use uh, UDP uh, if uh, the message is bigger than uh, the packet, uh, so it will span uh, more than one packet. It's better to use UDP that. Uh, uh, TCP that uh, we're uh, seeing right now. Uh, TCP is the exact opposite of a UDP. It's a kind of heavy protocol, uh, kind of uh, slow protocol, all, all is relative, obviously, uh, but it uh, guarantees uh, uh, all kind of uh, uh, checking. And uh, so there is a uh, uh, resend, uh, uh, there are buffers, uh, so uh, both order, uh, integrity, and delivery, uh, they are all, uh, um, they are all uh, guaranteed. Uh, that's because uh, um, TCP uh, 
uh, is a connection protocol uh, that will build uh, like a virtual tube uh, between A and B. And that tube uh, is, uh, let's say, a perfect tube uh, where uh, things uh, uh, will go one each uh, order, uh, one after the other, and uh, uh, they are ensured uh, uh, to be delivered. Uh, Unipiso has no connection, and uh, uh, the, what uh, uh, to us appear uh, to be uh, a stream between two uh, points uh, is just uh, a sequence uh, of uh, one shot uh, where uh, I am just sending uh, one shot after another shot and uh, they are not connected uh, one to each other at the level of network. Uh, at the level of application, uh, both me and my peer uh, will um, will have to check that uh, all packets uh, has been um, delivered and uh, are understood. And this is uh, one of the feature of, of the functions uh, that the SIP uh, do uh, extremely well. And uh, we have uh, uh, markers uh, into the protocol for sequences. Uh, we have timer that uh, if uh, uh, a packet has not been confirmed uh, as received uh, 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 after some milliseconds, then it is uh, uh, resent, et cetera, et cetera. So all this, uh, um, all the uh, guarantees uh, that are not given by the network protocol are um, are built into SIP, into uh, the session uh, protocol. <clears throat> uh, UTP. Uh, has no uh, the, the concept of connection. So uh, when I need to uh, send a message, I just send it. That's it. I send it to you. That's it. Uh, TCP is uh, uh, totally different. Uh, I can only send into a tube between me and you. And uh, if the tube is broken, I have to build another tube and me and you must cooperate uh, to uh, build uh, that tube. Also, uh, if the tube is broken and uh, uh, we build a new one, um, that new tube is not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a, um, a substitute uh, is not uh, uh, something that seamlessly uh, substitute the, the old one, but is uh, some kind of a new thing that uh, both me and you must adapt to. <clears throat> so from uh, the SIP uh, point of view, in TCP, uh, each time uh, we broke uh, we break the tube, uh, we uh, interrupt the connection, we must uh, recreate our entire world. So we must recreate the connection, but then uh, we have to re-register to uh, have the correct location, and uh, we have to uh, recreate uh, the dialogues and the media streams. The connections in TCP uh, are not so strong and uh, they break uh, uh, kind of often and for many reasons. Uh, most notably are uh, for sure the change of network uh, is uh, by default uh, break uh, the connection uh, because you are changing the network, <laughs> and uh, but uh, you have also uh, network glitches uh, that are uh, interrupting uh, and uh, break uh, your TCP connection, and uh, uh, 
uh, many uh, errands at the level of uh, the operating system. Uh, it can also be as easy as uh, having a, a computer that's busy and uh, uh, too many uh, tabs uh, in your browser. And the, the problem, uh, at least for uh, WebRTC, for SIP, uh, with the TCP connections, uh, is that they tend to break uh, when they are not active. So uh, they, uh, it's not so big a problem uh, to have uh, a call that is dropped uh, because the, the TCP connection is interrupted. But this almost never happen, uh, if not because of a change of network. But uh, it, uh, it very easily uh, happen uh, when the connection is not active. So for example, uh, you have uh, uh, your uh, um, uh, call center uh, WebRTC client uh, uh, open in front of you, uh, but uh, uh, nobody uh, calls you for uh, uh, some hours. It's uh, very much possible uh, that the connection will break in this period and uh, uh, next call will not reach you uh, because uh, in the server uh, you are mapped on the old uh, connection and that uh, old connection that uh, make you uh, be available for the server uh, actually do not correspond to a real tube uh, that is working between the client and the server. So the server will try to send you a call, but it will not work. You will not receive the call. Uh, uh, Maxima say, um, another annoying property that comes out of it uh, is that it can simply clog uh, instead of breaking. Yeah, uh, that's very important too. And uh, uh, you, you can have uh, that tube that is clogged and uh, uh, it can be uh, because all the buffers are overflowing or uh, because uh, simply uh, you have an overload on uh, on your network, and uh, and this <clears throat> is a, a, a even uh, worse uh, than uh, uh, breaking the tube because a, a clogged tube will not work, but will not the signal himself uh, uh, to be not working, because uh, at least a break a broken tube uh, signal himself. And uh, in, in this way, uh, you will not uh, um, you will not uh, receive uh, the call, and uh, uh, you will still be uh, sensed as available by the server uh, because the tube is there. Also, if it doesn't work, uh, so we have the problem in WebRTC in uh, keeping uh, the TCP connection alive. And uh, th this sounds uh, like uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, keeping a pinhole uh, into, uh, into the net uh, of the uh, client open. And <clears throat> while uh, keeping uh, uh, the, the net open uh, is uh, kind of easily solved, uh, just uh, uh, by having uh, uh, the client uh, sending uh, some uh, some packets uh, to the server, and uh, uh, just because uh, the packets uh, has come out uh, from the client, uh, the client connection uh, will stay open for the server to reach the client. And that's a technique uh, that uh, is working uh, perfectly, uh, almost perfectly, uh, all world around. Uh, and is uh, how uh, all the uh, SIP phones uh, uh, works uh, traditionally in uh, UDP. Uh, keeping a, a TCP connection alive is a very different thing uh, because 
you for sure uh, must also uh, keep the um, the pinhole open, but uh, this is uh, in itself uh, solved uh, because if you have the connection, you have uh, uh, the pinhole open. I mean, the, uh, the nut uh, is open for the connection because the connection is uh, stable. Uh, but the, the problem is that uh, you are working uh, at the level of the connection and uh, maybe uh, you have something uh, at the low level in the operating system in the library uh, that uh, if uh, uh, the tube is broken, uh, it will uh, rebuild the tube. But SIP doesn't know nothing about it. So it will end up that uh, SIP think to use one tube, and but that tube does not exist anymore and another one has been built, but SIP is not able to use it. So is not, not useful at all. And uh, that's why uh, for uh, in WebRTC, um, for keeping the connection uh, uh, alive, uh, the, the best thing that uh, I found is uh, to do it uh, at the level of the client, uh, particularly if you control uh, the, uh, the code of the client, uh, how the client works. Uh, so, more or less, uh, the client will send options to the server, and uh, if uh, options are not confirmed uh, uh, in a timeout, uh, the client will assume that the uh, tube is broken, and it will recreate it uh, from scratch, so it discard the old tube. Uh, it uh, build a new tube and then build all the SIP world, re-register on this new tube uh, with the new IP address or uh, new ports or whatever, all the environment, and then uh, try to uh, rebuild the dialogues. And uh, obviously it will resubscribe for any kind of presence, but uh, the interesting things is that uh, using the replaces uh, header uh, that uh, you can add to an invite, uh, you can uh, keep a call going. Also, uh, if you change network, for example, or uh, if you have a broken uh, tube. And uh, uh, another uh, aspect uh, of, uh, um, of the difference between uh, UDP and TCP from uh, the SIP point of view is how you deal with uh, high availability. Uh, high availability is the capability to resist uh, uh, also if a software crash or a server burn down. Uh, so you usually uh, have uh, two uh, proxies uh, similar in capabilities uh, in an active passive setup. So one is active and the other uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, sleeping, uh, but uh, sharing data with the active one. Uh, if the active one uh, dies at software or hardware level, uh, the passive will become active and will get its uh, internet address and uh, it will start working uh, impersonating uh, the active uh, proxy. Uh, so it will have all uh, the uh, location and dialogues uh, data already uh, in memory uh, because of uh, OpenSIP's uh, clustering, and uh, it will recreate uh, uh, the current uh, uh, calls, the current uh, uh, audio streams, uh, media streams, uh, at, uh, by um, RTP Engine, uh, because RTP Engine is able uh, to reread uh, all uh, its own data from uh, uh, Redis uh, uh, database, and uh, this is enough uh, to have uh, <clears throat> a uh, failover uh, from uh, one 
uh, RTP engine uh, that is dying uh, to uh, another active RTP engine. So um, this way uh, you have uh, uh, a complete uh, uh, failover from uh, the active to the passive that becomes the new active uh, that is totally transparent to client. So client actually uh, is uh, not supposed to perceive uh, nothing, the users, and uh, uh, at the software level, uh, the, uh, the software clients uh, have uh, nothing to do uh, with this uh, transfer of functions uh, between passive and active, and uh, for them, nothing has happened. In, uh, in TCP, uh, that's totally impossible uh, because uh, uh, when uh, the active dies, uh, all the tubes that, that goes uh, from the active to the world and from the world to the active uh, will uh, break. So all of them will break uh, simultaneously and uh, nobody, uh, nothing is no more working. Uh, so you move the uh, IP address uh, uh, to the active uh, uh, proxy, but uh, uh, you have no way to recreate uh, the tubes, uh, to recreate uh, uh, the um, dialogues, uh, uh, the calls, uh, the streams, uh, and all the SIP world. Uh, so what happened? Uh, if you want to implement high availability uh, in TCP, uh, you must uh, uh, do it uh, mostly from the client uh, side. So uh, the, uh, the active proxy dies, uh, the passive becomes the new active and uh, get uh, the IP address. It will be the clients that will sense uh, that the tube is broken and uh, will rebuild a new tube between himself and the new active and rebuild all the uh, SIP ward. So it will re-register and re-invite uh, uh, eventual calls with uh, replaces and uh, resubscribe uh, to uh, to presence. So location dialogues uh, are uh, recreated uh, this way. In uh, uh, at the level of uh, uh, the RTP streams, uh, we are uh, the uh, streams that are probably uh, recreated. Uh, from uh, uh, Redis, uh, if anyone, anything, uh, if they are uh, WebRTC streams, uh, they will be of no use at all. Uh, so uh, uh, they will be created for nothing, but uh, they will be immediately uh, shut up and uh, substituted by uh, the new streams that uh, will be created by the re-invite that uh, will, uh, will happen into uh, open zips that will tell to uh, RTP engine to recreate new streams. So in this case, uh, high availability uh, is mostly performed uh, by client. The server, the only thing that it does it move uh, the IP address. Uh, in WebRTC, all uh, is encrypted, both uh, uh, signaling and media. And uh, it, it, does, it, it doesn't have a work uh, if you don't have uh, real SSS certificates. I mean, also with the uh, auto-signed uh, certificates, it's very difficult to, to make it work. And uh, uh, we, we've seen that uh, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, to have a high availability, so you can't just move uh, an, uh, an encrypted uh, stream uh, from uh, uh, one machine to another because uh, all uh, the, uh, um, 
the agreement uh, between uh, uh, the two parties and the exchange of keys, etc., uh, must be repeated. And uh, uh, but uh, we solved that uh, with the reinvite uh, with our replace. And uh, but uh, uh, the other problem is that uh, from an operational point of view. Uh, we cannot tell uh, what is happening because we can't debug, we can't trace. Uh, we, 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 we can have uh, our packet captures, but those packet captures are totally uh, unuseful because they are encrypted. We cannot read it. And uh, uh, so the important thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh it's uh, uh, we we must uh, keep uh, uh webrtc at the gate uh, on the periphery and uh, uh have our own internal uh network our own uh, uh whole platform that is working with plain old uh udp unencrypted and but uh, Okay, but uh, it's, uh, you can say, uh, but uh, we had uh, TCP at least uh, since uh, we had the UDP transport as part of uh, uh, the RSA uh, 3261. And uh, TLS is uh, uh, a little bit later. So it's uh, so much time that they are there. Okay, but in, re in real world, uh, almost nobody used there. Uh, it's used at the level of the LAN, it's used, uh, it's used inside VPNs, but uh, you don't have a massive residential uh, subscription uh, services uh, based on uh, TCP. It will just uh, have, uh, uh, I mean, it, it just doesn't happen and uh, has never been uh, in existence. This is a new, totally new thing uh, with uh, WebRTC. Uh, that's because uh, the browser is omnipresent and also because WebRTC is, uh, 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 is probably uh, uh, be used as a, a protocol also by Internet of Things. Uh, so uh, we, will, uh, we will see. Uh, more and more uh, with this uh, uh, kind of implementation. And uh, uh, so we can see in this uh, uh, generic sketch that uh, uh, on the uh, left part, uh, we can have uh, uh, all the various uh, uh, transports. Uh, they can be UDP, it can be TLS, uh, it can be WebSocket, uh, etc. And uh, the media can be encrypted, uh, can be with uh, many uh, different codecs, uh, etc. On the uh, right side of the picture, uh, we have uh, our own platform, and inside all, uh, our platform, uh, we only have uh, uh, tried and true plain old uh, uh, unencrypted uh, UDP with uh, RTP. And uh, uh, possibly also uh, only the codex uh, of our choice. Uh, we want to have uh, inside our platform uh, a normalized transport, uh, normalized uh, uh, media streams, uh, and uh, uh, no uh, exception, no particular cases, no nothing. Uh, we want to have it uh, at the minimum commune uh, denominator and uh, uh, to be sure that uh, uh, all uh, the services, uh, the techniques, uh, but also uh, legacy systems, uh, uh, also uh, legacy uh, techniques uh, uh, will work well for any kind uh, of call. And we want to keep the packet's length uh, under the fragmentation limit. Uh, so uh, we want to simplify the packets that in WebRTC are uh, very, very, very big because uh, they contain a lot of codecs, uh, they contain uh, eyes, uh, etc. And uh, we want to strip uh, all that stuff. 
And uh, uh, so let's see how to use OpenSIPs and RTP engine uh, to achieve uh, our aim. Uh, we use uh, OpenSIPs uh, to our WebRTC uh, to accept uh, the TCP, the HTTP connection, that is a normal HTTP connection uh, like uh, uh, from a browser, and uh, uh, then support the upgrade of this connection to uh, the WebSocket protocol. And inside the WebSocket protocol, uh, OpenSIPs uh, will speak uh, the SIP sub protocol of WebSocket. Uh, and uh, uh, from that point on, uh, is pure SIP and is uh, normal. Uh, OpenSIPs in this case uh, uh, can be prepended uh, by an HA proxy or even NG NGINX, I believe, but I'm not uh, uh, using it. Uh, for uh, both for dealing with uh, HTTP and TLS. So uh, actually OpenSIPs uh, will only do uh, the upgrade, the upgraded connection of the uh, uh, WebSocket uh, non-secure. Uh, uh, what this brings us, uh, uh, this uh, can be very useful in an uh, uh, in a corporate environment uh, uh, where uh, you have uh, all your connections that is passing through an HA proxy, and uh, that will uh, also uh, manage uh, all the uh, uh, SSL certificates uh, and TLS, uh, etc. And uh, uh, HA proxy uh, is uh, is able also to uh, uh, reload uh, uh, in, in real time uh, uh, from the file system uh, the certificates, or uh, it, it can be all uh, done by uh, OpenSIPs, uh, uh, both the TLS, uh, uh, HTTP, and WebSockets. <clears throat> OpenSIPs uh, will then uh, proxy so route uh, to normal plain old uh, VoIP on UDP and RTP uh, through other sockets. So it will uh, have uh, one web socket, one UDP socket, and uh, uh, will route packets between the two, uh, doing all the necessary uh, translations. <clears throat> OpenSIPs also gives uh, uh, RTP Engine all the commands and informations that RTP Engine needs uh, uh, to rewrite uh, the SDP, so the, the part of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the message that define uh, the media stream. And also, uh, again, OpenSIPs, uh, it will change uh, uh, all NAT and uh, transport uh, uh, related headers. Uh, so uh, the messages uh, can flow, um, can flow uh, well uh, back and forth uh, between any uh, of, of two sockets, uh, any of the two. Uh, client servers, uh, etc. <clears throat> RTP Engine uh, will be uh, commanded by OpenSIPs uh, to open ports uh, and uh, uh, accept uh, and route uh, uh, media streams uh, uh, between uh, a couple of ports. Uh, in uh, doing that, uh, for example, it will open a port uh, toward A and a port toward B, and it will accept a stream uh, that is uh, a WebRTC stream, uh, stream that is encrypted from A, and it will route uh, to B after having unencrypted it and uh, changed the uh, uh, various other fundamentals characters. For example, it can transcode uh, between uh, different uh, codifications and uh, operate at the level of uh, uh, multiplexing and the multiplexing uh, RTCP inside the, uh, the uh, media stream. <clears throat> 
RTP engine also uh, gets uh, uh, the STP, uh, the part of the packet that, that describe uh, um, the stream uh, from uh, OpenSIPS uh, and uh, it will do all the uh, text operation on that uh, SDP and will give it back uh, to OpenSIPS uh, that uh, and OpenSIPS uh, will route it uh, uh, to its uh, destination. Particularly, uh, RTP Engine uh, will add and delete uh, uh, ICE candidates, codecs, uh, encryption. So uh, we'll, uh, we will end up from a mammoth package of, uh, uh, packet of, uh, uh, or message of uh, uh, three uh, kilobytes, uh, it will end up uh, into uh, a normal uh, void packets uh, in UDP uh, that uh, can be routed uh, um, below uh, the, the fragmentation limit, so under uh, 1,400 rows. <coughs> and uh, OpenSIPS, uh, uh, again, in, uh, in this case, uh, let's see at the, at the signaling because uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to monitor and to, uh, to be able to, to debug and to trace uh, what happens uh, to our calls. And um, OpenSIPS is able uh, to write out or in a file or uh, on a HEP socket uh, the uh, packets as they are seen uh, inside OpenSIPS, so unencrypted. And uh, this way we can use it, uh, for example, from SNGREP, but from Homer, uh, from HEPIC, uh, to uh, debug and trace uh, what happens to our call, why a call is failing or uh, interoperability problems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's uh, uh, writing into files, uh, uh, text files, is uh, uh, a new feature from uh, uh, 3.2. And the next uh, version uh, will probably be able also uh, to write uh, pickups, uh, so like uh, with TCP dump, but uh, uh, it's already possible to export uh, as pickup uh, from Homer, for example. Uh, after Homer has received it uh, uh, as a HEP uh, from uh, OpenSIPS. And uh, uh, RTP Engine uh, is able to, uh, in a uniform way, uh, to give statistics uh, on each kind of call, uh, but uh, uh, WebRTC and normal calls. And uh, <coughs> so uh, we can have uh, uh, but uh, uh, data series uh, and uh, uh, real-time visualizations uh, for uh, uh, how it's going in terms of uh, RTT, in terms of MOS, uh, uh, et cetera. Quality uh, of the calls, uh, uh, not only uh, the signaling. And uh, uh, sorry. Inside our platform, we have a completely normalized environment. Uh, all calls uh, looks and behave exactly the same. And so uh, we're sure that all our uh, platform, all our techniques that can be also legacy, all uh, the kind of uh, services that uh, we can add uh, from outside will work uh, because we have a, a uniform and a very controlled environment. What's new in 3.2? Uh, we already saw that uh, uh, is a new thing that uh, we can uh, dump uh, the zip packets uh, into files and uh, a lot of effort has been put also in making uh, the tracing uh, more uh, um, uh, ductile and uh, uh, useful. 
<clears throat> but uh, the, the the very big thing that uh, uh, in uh, this uh, use case uh, is happening with three two dot two uh, is that uh, we have a new module that has been uh, written uh, just to uh, make it easy and fail proof uh, to use uh, uh, RTP engine and RTP proxy. Uh, what what What's that? Uh, actually, uh, we have this new module called the RTP Relay, uh, where uh, at the time of the invite, so when uh, we first uh, receive uh, um, the invite, uh, we set uh, the parameters for both the stream and uh, how we want it to be messaged. And then uh, that uh, uh, module uh, will do all the work uh, uh, for us. Uh, this means that uh, it will be able uh, to shut down uh, the stream when it's no more in use because of a buy or because of a timeout. Uh, we'll be able to re-anchor it, uh, etc., etc. So. Is uh, a lot of uh, uh, logic and uh, programming that is not only spared but is uh, fail proof because uh, has been automated in a way to uh, work always. And uh, just uh, some uh, uh, references of uh, where uh, you can find the info for this. Um, but uh, OpenSIPs and RTP Engine are uh, ready-made uh, packages uh, for Debian, so it's very easy to start uh, uh, experimenting with it. And uh, uh, the documentation for the relevant modules uh, are uh, mostly about uh, the protocols and uh, um, the uh, the RTP proxies uh, and tracer. Uh, what I can uh, absolutely cancel is to uh, go read uh, all uh, the relevant or related uh, posts uh, into the OpenSIPS blog uh, that are very detailed and very useful uh, because uh, uh, they go to illustrate uh, uh, down uh, to the detail, uh, uh, some interesting techniques uh, that uh, I just uh, uh, described uh, in a uh, dumbed down uh, uh, way. And uh, this is the end of uh, my presentation. I tried to uh, convey uh, in a rush uh, all that is needed uh, to integrate uh, this uh, important uh, protocol because uh, billions of browsers are able uh, to speak it, but uh, you don't want uh, uh, to uh, throw around my home uh, into uh, your platform. So let's accept WebRTC and speak WebRTC uh, with uh, all the browsers, but uh, let's keep uh, uh, things ordered and functional internally uh, to our platform. Uh, please, questions. First of all, thank you, Giovanni. That was amazing. Man, take a breath, brother. Take a breath. <laughs> to the marathon presentation. So do we yeah, have any go, questions here for Giovanni? Let's go with the raffle. Wait. I know there's a question out there. I see it that's on the That's not a question. That's, that's, a, that's a statement <laughs> or a desire. Oh. You know what? I don't take not having any questions as anything bad. It's just that you are so informative. You've answered pretty much everybody's questions through that presentation, which was very very like in depth, man. Like, awesome. Well done. <laughs> Comprehensive is the word you're looking Comprehensive for. Comprehensive was the word I was looking for. Yes. <laughs> Scott Howell, 
on the uh, Slack is saying that he wants to get started with WebRTC right away. You're triggering a new, a new generation of developers, my friend. <laughs> you, you are a good preacher, Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up our talks for today. Thank you again, Giovanni. Thank you to all the speakers for all the amazing information that you have presented with us today. We do have one more day of speakers uh, this week, and next week we'll be having some uh, design clinics and some training. Um, no, work, workshops and training, not design clinics. Sorry. They're workshops. Either way, there's going to be more open sips next week, so make sure that uh, you rest up this weekend. Um, I think that we want to make a couple of announcements before uh, we actually get to our raffle. Give Livy you a few minutes to warm up the picker. Uh, Bogdan, you do have some news for us, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. So um, it seems like uh, we did a very, very, very good job. In, uh, in the previous days uh, when it comes to convincing or urging people to donate in order to, uh, you know, uh, raise the whole amount, the full amount of money uh, in order to, uh, to, go, to do the security audit. Uh, so uh, during uh, this day, uh, if hopefully my math is correct, uh, and thanks to everybody, we actually reached uh, our goal. So the whole amount was That's raised. Awesome. And thanks to everyone for, you know, contributing. Doesn't matter, you know, uh, what's the uh, what's the amount. But it, uh, the most important is everybody uh, did a bit of an effort to to help uh, to help with us. And uh, yeah, it was a collective uh, collective effort. Um, so uh, now everything it's uh, more or less on uh, Sandro's uh, shoulders. He has to do the job. We did and, our part. And Alfred. <laughs> that's Sorry? awesome. And Alfred, that's not for you. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, correct. I must say, there's nothing more beautiful than shaking a person and watching money fall out. <laughs> And we did a quite a bit of that to everybody here. And thank you again for your generosity. It's amazing news. In the near future, we're going to have a better, more secure open SIPs. Everyone's going to get to benefit from this. Exactly. That's, uh, that's uh, the other side. The fact that um, uh, the true benefiters of this um, uh, audit and hopefully improve the improved secure, more secure open SIPs um is uh, the full community so everyone using open ships will benefit of uh, of this we are we are just a proxy in both direction proxy from one direction to pass the money proxy the result <laughs> from the other direction so we are transparent <laughs> proxy here <laughs> living up to your to your reputation i have a question bogdan actually if you don't mind um about the security audit what is um what is kind of uh procedure if, if let's say they find some issues um, um serious issues or maybe important issues whatever what is the kind of disclosure how, how are you guys going to handle it is it is it going to be fixed in uh, production releases or uh, have you have you been thinking about that part uh well indeed that's uh, that's a very uh, delicate uh, topic i mean if it comes to finding some really really sensitive thing that may affect uh let's say thousands of open ships running out there in the wild um and uh, to be honest uh, there is no uh, let's say clear way how to to proceed uh, on a first impression, uh, I would I would say that okay, we need to give a heads up to everyone. Uh, but this, as soon as uh, as soon as uh, a fix it's available, on uh, you know on most of the uh, let's say running uh, versions of uh, OpenSips, uh, ideally we should not uh, try to let's say uh, uh, spread fear and uh, disclose uh, disclose potential vulnerabilities. 
of course, if they are to be found, uh, without providing also a quick uh, fix for that. Um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's see exactly what uh, uh, they will uh, found what they will find. Sorry, and uh, how um, how to say uh, how um, uh, dangerous the you know the vulnerabilities uh, will be. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Thanks. Awesome. Well, uh, that's our our show for today. For the most part, we're going to be going into our uh, favorite time of the day, which is the raffles. Bogdan, you want to tell us what we have up today? Uh, yeah, today it's the last day of repeating myself for four days. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah for for uh, for today we have the uh, the usual t-shirt a fresh one unused one uh and the design uh one hour of uh, design uh, design clinic uh, uh with uh, with the open uh, team um still to mention that tomorrow we'll have the big prize so we'll we'll break the pattern and go for the big price for the for the backpack that's very exciting news about the backpack and i'm very conscious that the panel session i'll be running is just ahead of the big backpack giveaway uh yeah uh, uh that's uh you mentioned something uh, uh very uh very interesting uh, David, uh, because um, the panel you just mentioned, it's a quite new addition um, to the uh, to the schedule, uh, and um, uh, it, it, it I think it's uh, it uh, it pays off to actually announce it through through other channel that than uh, social media and web schedule. Um, uh, as mentioned, uh, there is a quite uh, recent addition to the schedule. On Friday, in uh, at the end, so after the last presentation, we will have an uh, an uh, panel about, uh, of course, about uh, open uh, open source. Um, and uh, actually, it's uh, we want to to get some uh, um, to see. Uh, more or less, what's the uh, um, to evaluate the interaction between uh, between the open the open source uh, project and uh, their uh, communities. So it's a quite kind of a philosophical, if I can say say so, but also technical discussion between uh, the symbiotic relation between uh, between uh, these two the open uh, the open source project. Um, the developers behind it and on the other on the other hand um the uh, contributors of the uh, no, sorry not only contributors but the whole community so uh that's uh that's the panel uh david will be the uh, moderator and we have uh, uh four other uh, um, participants uh to this uh panel uh, we have um, uh, Alan Quayle uh, as an op open source uh, advocate uh, and uh, a very uh, pertinent uh, external, uh, let's say, uh, viewer of uh, all these open source ecosystems. Uh, we have uh, Dan Bogos from uh, CG Rates uh, to see how, how the things are going with the CG Rates pro project and its uh, community. Um, Rosvan uh, Kraina, Kraina will be from our side, from the OpenSips project, and uh, also Lorenzo Miniero from the Janus project, uh, again, to share uh, the uh, share opinions and uh, ideas from, uh, from other projects uh, too. And of course, uh, as said, uh, David Duffett uh, will be uh, the uh, moderator of this uh, panel. The panel starts at uh, five thirty GMT, so uh, uh, just uh, just uh, to know, and uh, you'll find all the details on uh, on the schedule. So, titled the symbiotic relation between 
open source projects and its uh, uh, community. Looking forward to that very much. And uh, Bogdan, was it you or Razvan that uh, we should credit with coming up with the word symbiotic? Uh, it's a good like word. a man that doesn't want the blame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to anticipate what will follow, like was it good or a bad? <laughs> Blame it on Razvan and call it a day. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's blame Razvan for this. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you, guys. Liviu, how are we looking? She's all ready. She warmed up? Yep. Burn. I hope, I hope Liviu's going to be repeating the amazing success of the last couple of days. Let's see if we can replicate. Okay, people. Javier Quintana. Nice. Javier, are nice you here? Choice. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if he's online. Javier. Come on, say something. We need to see you typing. Somebody's typing. I think whatever technology has been used for the picker, somebody should get in on the technology and write a little bot that responds when they've been picked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next Looks one. Looks like Javier is not going to make yeah. it. Yeah. The pick is in. Emino Poli. Let's see. Is yeah. it the second time luckier? Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yes. Congratulations. Look, Javier put up the, put the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. I think you, you may need to dig yeah. deep and find two t shirts somehow. Quick, Bogdan, take off your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a close call. I'm not sure who. How can we judge this? Yeah, I, I think, think we can. We can. We can have. Uh, you know, like uh, actually, uh, this year the Olympics. Uh, there was a case where there were like uh, two athletes who were winning gold medal. Uh, I'm not sure. It's like uh, high jumping over the over some. I don't know what's the name English name for that uh, sport. I was in. Uh, well, was an Italian and. Uh, I don't know, some, some guy from Middle East. So they're like two winners. They got both uh, gold medals. So we can share. If uh, if uh, Javier can uh, write us a word over there uh, on the yeah. chat, then uh, yeah, we will uh, uh, we, we consider having like two winners for, for, for this. Uh... Very good well. of you, Bogdan, making that exact uh, executive decision there. Top <laughs> okay. Thanks you have here. So uh, we have uh, we have two uh, so far two lucky winners. Let's see who will do the design clinic now. Just so we know, this is not going to happen with the design clinic. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you better be ready. Ashutosh. 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 Ashutosh, are you here? So if, if he replies, he'll be staying up late yeah, looks in like geography. A... Ashutosh. Oh, my goodness. Ashutosh. Uh, we, we also have to take into account the YouTube delay. I'm not sure. We're supposed right. to be in the channel. What do you mean, the YouTube delay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's... Yeah. Uh, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's do it, Livio. Yep. I'm getting her ready. Okay. Basitan GR. Again. This looks Love like more good. Yeah, it looks like Greek. <laughs> or maybe he's both English and Greek. Green. Come on. 
Ah, hey, look. Uh, oh, <laughs> <cash in. laughs> no, uh, we no. don't want this hat to happen Same. again. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We're going to have to put, put this up to the executive no, no, decider it, of games here. It, it, oh, he was, yeah, the first it, one, wasn't he? I'm going to yes. call on, I'm going to call on David Duffett for this one. Uh, the, the trouble with calling on me, Alex, is I'm too kind. I'm just too kind. So I, I will say that we should go with Ashu Tosh, who did make it in the end. And uh, especially since uh, Bazin Te Tenge, uh, uh, the second guy, didn't make it, let's give it to the first one, even though he's a little bit late. How about that? I agree. Do I get a third? Yeah. Fair okay. enough. Yeah. Ashu Tosh, okay. congratulations. Okay. So I, I was about to say both uh, winners, but actually there are three winners. Uh, we will contact you uh, in order to uh, probably next uh, to arrange for during next week uh, for delivery and for uh, for uh, scheduling uh, uh, the clinic. So it, it's a very beautiful thing to see that the community is agreeing with the decision made there on the channel. They're happy. You did good, David. You were fair <laughs> and equitable. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, that wraps up our activities for today. Thanks to so much for everybody that was able to make it. All of our participants, our speakers, our sponsors, and of course, the Open Sips team for putting this together. We're going to be here again tomorrow, same time, with another round of great speakers. And don't forget, like Bogdan had uh, announced earlier, we're going to have a, an open source panel at the end of tomorrow. So that's going to be very interesting. A lot of different projects coming together. Make sure that you uh, pencil us in on your calendar. Yeah, Something check uh, check the calendar link uh, from um, from the uh, OpenSIP Summit uh, webpage because you have all the details over there in terms of... Uh, you know uh, what's uh, what's running every day and uh, the hours, so you can plan. And just out of curiosity, Bogdan, are all the seats filled in the training yet? Um, it's uh, very difficult to say uh, when uh, when you have a virtual class because basically you don't have a actual seat. You know, <laughs> you, if you yeah, if you if you say uh, if uh, all the squares on the screen in your conference are filled in. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of capacity right now, uh, I think uh, it's um, it's uh, filled up um, uh, with uh, with, the, with the students. Uh, probably a higher number will have to uh, to to do what we did last year, basically running two trainings in two def uh, different uh, days. So uh, we are at the critical mass when to move forward. Yeah. You have to split. So. So it's, it's around uh, twenty six students right now. Just as a uh, ballpark wow. number. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so what you're saying is registration is pretty much closed unless we have like a group of 10 or 15 come in and make it viable to split the, the trainings, right? Kind of, but uh, yeah. Okay, in, that's all right. In a matter of two days, I don't, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> you, you never know. You never know. People, are, people across this community are, are friends everywhere. So you might find that They'll get together and, and surprise you. Nonetheless, next week has the, um, the training. So for all of you that are registered, don't forget. And come back and see us again tomorrow, everyone. Thank you so much. Good job, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. See you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.